rapidement euh, présenter le sujet. On a une matinée euh, très intéressante, très euh, intensif. Il y aura trois panels distincts. Un panel qui est donc euh, l'innovation et, le, et les services financiers qui est euh, modéré par euh, euh, Sylvestre Tando de Barzac. On aura un autre panel aussi très intéressant sur l'innovation et les services juridiques, les Legal Tech, euh, qui sera modéré par Jean-Pierre Buil et par Alex Schmitt. Et un troisième euh, panel aussi très intéressant qui est sur l'innovation et le droit de l'espace, euh, qui sera modéré par euh, André Prume. Restez jusqu'au bout parce que c'est vraiment euh, un panel, enfin, une session euh, très intéressante. À présent, je vais donner donc la parole au ministre des Finances, Pierre Gramegna. Monsieur le ministre. Excellences, mesdames et messieurs, merci de m'avoir invité pour participer à ce congrès de l'Union internationale des avocats. J'ai, en concertation avec les organisateurs, décidé de parler un peu en français et un peu en anglais pour qu'il euh, y ait une juste répartition de l'effort d'écoute. Nous avons l'habitude au Luxembourg de parler la langue de nos clients, de nos amis, et euh, c'est une des choses qui fait la force de notre pays. Alors bienvenue dans notre pays, vous êtes ici au Kirchberg, au, un des sièges principaux de l'Union européenne et à deux pas d'ici, il y a la Cour européenne de justice qui est un, un des endroits les plus prestigieux pour les juristes, peut-être ensemble avec la Cour suprême des états unis Et donc de tenir votre congrès ici est un choix judicieux, je l'apprécie, je, je, je vous félicite d'être venu chez nous et vous l'avez certainement remarqué pour ceux qui viennent chez nous pour la première fois, nous avons beaucoup d'avocats au Luxembourg. Je pense que la densité d'avocats par rapport à la population est très élevée. Cela est dû au fait qu'on a une grande place financière mais aussi au caractère tout à fait international de notre pays. J'ai pensé que j'allais vous parler euh, un peu des défis qui se posent aux juristes euh, aujourd'hui dans les domaines qui nous touchent de près que sont euh, en fait les défis de la modernisation de nos économies et du fonctionnement euh, du monde. Euh, on a eu une accélération phénoménale au cours des 30-40 dernières années euh, due au fait euh, que la troisième révolution industrielle avec euh, euh, le dessin en 3D généré par ordinateur euh, est devenue une réalité. Une autre accélération extraordinaire vient de l'intelligence artificielle et euh, finalement tout cela est basé aussi sur la révolution qu'ont apporté, euh, qu apporté les technologies de l'information. Sans oublier bien sûr l'élément décisif qu'est euh, l'internet qui fait que les connaissances se diffusent à une rapidité extraordinaire. Et c'est peut-être cette rapidité de diffusion des connaissances, la, la rapidité de diffusion des biens et des services qui caractérise notre époque. Et lorsque l'on dit rapidité de transmission des informations, des biens et des services des capitaux, eh bien, on pense tout de suite à la dimension internationale de toute chose. Et il est clair qu'un pays comme le nôtre, dont la surface est relativement petite, et dont la population est très cosmopolite, est très conscient de cette évolution, et nous essayons de nous, y, de nous y adapter. Alors je voudrais, dans ma très brève introduction, euh, parler de la dimension internationale des défis qui nous attendent, qui vous attendent en tant que juriste, et puis de la dimension nationale, qui en fait veut dire comment on s'ajuste en tant que pays à ces défis euh, du changement. Je prendrai pour la dimension internationale euh, deux sujets qui, en particulier qui me tiennent très à cœur et qui illustrent tout à fait mon propos. 
Le premier, c'est le changement climatique et le deuxième, c'est la révolution de la numérisation de l'économie ou de la digitalisation de l'économie. Qu'est-ce qu'on qu constate comme point commun sur ces deux sujets, eh bien, ce sont des sujets éminemment internationaux. Si nous voulons agir sur le climat, il faut qu'on agisse tous ensemble. J'ai participé moi-même à l'accord la, de, de Kyoto en 1997 en tant que porte-parole de l'Union européenne à l'occasion de cette grande conférence, le Luxembourg ayant eu à l'époque la, la présidence de l'Union européenne. Et j'ai participé à l'élaboration de l'accord de Paris en étroite collaboration avec notre ministre de l'Environnement. Eh bien, sur le climat, nous ne pouvons avoir des résultats que si nous agissons de concert. L'accord de Paris, qui a été signé par plus de 190 pays, nous donne un cadre qu'il faut après mettre en œuvre au niveau national. Et pour ce qui est du changement climatique, nous le faisons à l'échelle Européenne. Nous avons donc une dimension internationale, une dimension européenne et puis une dimension nationale. Et c'est cette interaction de, de tous ces euh, euh, périmètres euh, qu'il faut concilier. Vaste défi. Mais nous constatons aussi, et euh, la sortie officielle hier des états unis de l'accord du climat nous montre les limites de la méthode. Et si en plus le pays qui, avec la Chine, est celui qui a le plus d'émissions de CO2 sort de la Convention, il est clair que les efforts des autres acteurs sont un peu bridés. Nous avons euh, un autre sujet qui est la, la digitalisation des défis tout à fait similaires. Quel, quel est le défi que nous rencontrons dans la digitalisation c'est celui de pouvoir être efficace, amener des produits et des services rapidement près des consommateurs, ce que tout le monde apprécie. Et en même temps, nous constatons que euh, les risques euh, d'atteinte à la vie privée vont croissant. Ce que décrivait George Orwell dans son euh, fameux livre 1984 existe aujourd'hui. Et nous sommes très fiers en Europe, et c'est quelque chose, un domaine de régulation que certains d'entre vous suivent certainement de très près, c'est euh, la fameuse euh, réglementation sur la protection de la vie privée. Alors nous nous en orgueillons en tant qu'Européens d'avoir une réglementation qui est de loin la plus sophistiquée au monde pour protéger les données d'un côté tout en permettant d'exploiter le potentiel de l'économie Digital. Quand je voyage aux états unis on me dit vous êtes là en Europe à la pointe du progrès et il y a une vingtaine d'états aux états unis dont la Californie qui s'inspire de la législation européenne pour faire la même chose aux états unis Alors lorsque nous entendons cela nous sommes très contents, nous nous disons que c'est une très bonne chose et puis lorsque euh, je me rends en Chine, ce, ce que je fais deux à trois fois par an, je me rends compte que là, euh, euh, la priorité que nous donnons à la protection de la vie privée, et là je suis très diplomatique, a un rang de priorité très inférieur. Et grâce à cela, vous avez des acteurs comme WeChat euh, ou euh, Alibaba, qui ont plus d'un milliard de clients. Si vous avez plus d'un milliard de clients, vous pouvez avoir des statistiques, des données d'une précision folle sur, par exemple, le degré de paiement des dettes par les consommateurs. En fait, c'est quand même un, un paradoxe extraordinaire, j'avais un, un représentant de ICBC, qui est la plus grande banque du monde chinoise, 300 millions de clients, me dit « oui ». L'avantage de WeChat sur nous, c'est qu'ils ont quatre fois plus de clients et ils ont un avantage compétitif sur nous. Et je me dis, mais quels avantages compétitifs ont-ils sur l'Europe et sur les états unis Conclusion sur ce point, tout à fait provisoire. Il y a des défis juridiques énormes que nous ne pouvons résoudre que par le multilatéralisme. Et le multilatéralisme a les limites que je viens de citer. Donc, je dirais que 
la dimension internationale euh, est fondamentale et qu'on ne peut pas aujourd'hui non seulement l'ignorer, mais qu'il faut en être euh, un champion, un connaisseur pour pouvoir l'appliquer au jour le jour euh, à géométrie variable. La dimension nationale. Au Luxembourg, nous avons reconnu l'importance de du changement climatique ensemble avec l'Europe depuis des décennies, mais je vais peut-être plus me concentrer ici maintenant sur la digitalisation. Euh, nous en avons reconnu le potentiel et nous nous sommes organisés au sein du gouvernement pour en tenir compte. Euh, le gouvernement Battle 2, donc, euh, qui fait succession à Battle 1, qui est donc euh, au pouvoir depuis six ans, a mis la digitalisation comme point numéro un à l'ordre du jour des défis économiques. C'est notre Premier ministre lui-même qui s'occupe de ce sujet. Rares sont les pays où c'est le cas, ce qui fait que d'ailleurs il siège euh, à Bruxelles dans le conseil qui est consacré euh, à la technologie de l'information. And I'm now going to switch to English for those who prefer English. So being a Prime Minister and sitting around the table of IT ministers is an extraordinary advantage. In fact, just to, to give you a, a little bit of a, a hint of what happens in Brussels, when the discussions start, they always give the floor first to Mr. Bettel because he's the only prime minister around the table. But it just shows that we have recognized the importance uh, of that topic. So um, we have a digital initiative in Lux Luxembourg. We, are, we have an artificial intelligence initiative, and I'm not going to bore you with more examples. But again here, using the word artificial intelligence, I would like to put um, things in perspective. Out of the top 100 artificial intelligence companies in the world, there's only four out of Europe. We are far behind the United States and China. So let's not fool ourselves. We have to catch up a lot. And sometimes our regulations are such in Europe or in Luxembourg eventually that we make our lives more difficult than is necessary. On the other hand, I, I can see that in Europe we are sometimes also again ahead. I was in Paris two days ago and Prime Minister Edouard Philippe concluded the conference to which I participated um, at the Institut de France. And he gave a wonderful speech of 45 minutes of what challenges we have with artificial intelligence. And the rules, I would say the moral rules on the one hand and the legal rules that we need to apply to artificial intelligence are extremely complex and new. So in this realm, a lot has still to be invented. And I value and appreciate uh, the conference of today because when you speak about IT, digitalization, fintech, as we are going to do in the panel, uh, these challenges need to be uh, kept in mind. I give you an example of what we've done in Luxembourg, uh, talking about blockchain, for example. We have uh, made a law this year that recognizes that if you do a transaction through the blockchain, it has the same legal value uh, as when you do it in a traditional manner. Now, this sounds very easy. The principle is easy. The implementation is probably much more difficult. We have a long tradition here of trying to anticipate, and I, I would not like to anticipate too much on, on, on the panel that's going to follow, but in payment, for example, our country has anticipated many things compared to others, um, eventually, and especially, for example, for digital currencies. And I'm sure we'll have the opportunity in the panel to hear more uh, about it. Last but not least, we have recognized the important to have the right infrastructure. And here I think of data centers. You have in our country the largest concentration of tier four data centers uh, in the world. 12% of the world capacity in those data centers is here. It represents nearly a third of the whole capacity of Europe. As a result, uh, we've been successful in, in these areas, very often by having public-private partnerships.
Um, let me mention the Luxembourg House of FinTech that uh, we set up uh, two years ago and where more than 50 startups in the field of FinTech are thriving and developing. I could also mention InfraChain, which is a public-private initiative to put an additional customized layer on the blockchain. Now, you probably say to yourself, uh, this minister is very pleased about his country and he's talking about the virtues and qualities. We certainly have disadvantages. But what talks for itself is the results of our attractiveness. I mean, if our loft is already full, that we have to kick out companies that are mature, it shows you that we are attractive. But at European level too, we are attractive. Estonia has, for example, decided to set its digital embassy here in Luxembourg. The European Union uh, has decided to locate its high performance computer here in Luxembourg. And last but not least, the European Union has decided to put the data center of the European Union here in Luxembourg. It means there's 1,400 different systems of the European Union dealing with topics as different as climate change, structural funds, or EU single market, that all those data are stored and monitored and managed here in Luxembourg. So I started by welcoming you here in the country that hosts the EU institutions, including the EU Court of Justice, and I'm finishing my speech by telling you that the data center of European Union is here in Luxembourg. I think we've gone full circle in two languages, so let me say it also in English. Welcome to Luxembourg. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre, pour cette passionnante introduction. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers confrères, Le mot « défi » que vous avez mentionné, Monsieur le ministre, est effectivement au cœur de l'innovation en matière de services financiers. Et au-delà des opportunités que peuvent offrir les fintech, les cryptoactifs, les actifs numériques, le bitcoin, la blockchain, eh bien l'usage et l'apparition de ces innovations représente en réalité un triple défi. D'abord pour les acteurs de la finance et de la banque. Les fintech offrent des services à leurs clients, aux clients des banques, plus adaptés, plus rapides, moins chers et de surcroît en utilisant leurs infrastructures. Ce qui euh, crée euh, effectivement euh, une, on va dire, une rivalité. Et euh, la question que l'on peut se poser, c'est est-ce euh, que les fintech vont faire disparaître les banques Est-ce que les banques vont faire disparaître les fintech en les rachetant une après l'autre Ou est-ce que fintech et banques vont arriver à cohabiter Et nous avons tout récemment l'exemple de Eburi, une fintech euh, spécialisée dans les paiements, qui a été rachetée par euh, la banque Santander pour 400 millions d'euros, 50% du capital, ce qui valorise cette fintech créé en euh, 2009 à plus de 800 millions d'euros. Et Santander a annoncé un plan de 20 milliards d'euros d'investissement in the next four years in euh, fintech. Deuxième défi pour les consommateurs et les utilisateurs. Donne-moi tes données, give me your data, et je te donnerai accès à euh, des services financiers, à des produits bancaires plus facilement. Euh, le Libra euh, propose euh, effectivement de venir au secours des débancarisés. But in exchange, you will give them all your data. Et la question se pose du traitement de ces data, de ces données, du mauvais traitement possible de ces données. Et donc, euh, il y a effectivement un défi, je ne parle même pas de la sécurité euh, que représente la, la, la nécessaire sécurité euh, pour euh, les utilisateurs. Enfin, un défi aux régulateurs et aux législateurs. Faut-il réguler 
ou non ces innovations financières Est-ce qu'il faut, euh, si on doit euh, les encadrer réglementairement, sur la base de quel modèle Est-ce qu'il faut reprendre, faire du neuf avec de l'ancien, reprendre les cadres existants et les moderniser Est-ce qu'il faut créer ces fameuses sandbox euh, avec un cadre plus léger Ou est-ce qu'il faut une régulation de rupture Sachant que Montesquieu disait déjà que les lois inutiles affaiblissent les lois nécessaires. Voilà comment relever ces défis. Je me tourne donc vers nos quatre pénali... euh, pardon, <rire> panélistes. <rire> Sorry, c'est un lapsus d'avocat. Et euh, le, 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 qui vont euh, chacun à leur tour euh, évoquer euh, ces défis et donner euh, euh, leur vision. Euh, D'abord, M. Euh, Sébastien Raspillet, qui est actuellement chef du service financement de l'économie à la Direction générale du Trésor du ministère de l'économie et des finances, qui a été pilote du groupe Finance et de la stratégie nationale France Intelligence artificielle, et qui est très également, euh, également très impliqué euh, dans euh, l'élaboration de la loi Pacte, qui est une loi qui, justement, euh, a un volet concernant les actifs numériques. Et il va nous parler précisément de des usages et de l'opportunité de, de, de use and opportunities of artificial intelligence in the financial sector and presentation of the uh, system law pact. Uh, Mr. Rapier, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Sylvestre. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, this conference here in Luxembourg. Since the French Prime Minister has made a pitch on uh, artificial intelligence two, uh, two days ago, I will focus on blockchain. Uh, and I invite you to read the, the speech of Prime Minister on artificial intelligence. Uh, maybe to, to give a brief history of what we have done in France and the reasons why. First, we had in mind that blockchain technology, 2014, so when you cannot read any word blockchain in any newspaper, was still quite a possible opportunity in financial services. Why is that? Take financial services, it's a huge plumbery that takes, for instance, two days to deliver a share from person A to person B. Think of Amazon in Paris, or I guess in Luxembourg, you can order whatever you want and be delivered in two hours. So why is this a share? That is a dematerialized uh, title of property. Takes two days to be delivered with all the financial consequences you can imagine. If your counterparty is failing during these two days, for instance. And of course, think of the cost of the intermediation for doing the compensation, the clearing, and the settlement. And think of a blockchain. What is this? It's distributed ledger technology. It's quite a registration. And what is, I mean, a transfer of property of a company is transferring a share from a person A to a person B. So it fits perfectly within what blockchain uh, is able to provide. So we look in 2015 about our law and discovered that it was not fit for recognizing blockchain as uh, a legal means of transferring property. We have begun with kind of a sandbox approach by authorizing that on a very specific French type of so-called security, I would say that. It was quite old-fashioned bon de caisse, and we have modernized that, but it's quite small, just to check whether it could be fine or not. And if it wasn't, no worry, because it was so small that it would not endanger financial stability or anything like this. It worked. And it was quite useful also to enhance the registration of 
shareholders of small companies. Before, it was quite made on paper or at the best Excel spreadsheet with kind of, uh, you know, yearly at the best uh, re-examination of shareholders. So we have seen, developed some uh, fintechs saying to, for instance, SMEs, we can take, organize your registration of shareholders through blockchain and develop some easy smart contracts like payment of dividends after the general assembly. It was successful, so we have decided to expand that to the widest scope that was possible regarding EU law. Because EU law requires, for instance, for listed shares that you have a CSD, and CSD, so a central security depositor, you cannot do that through blockchain regarding the EU law. So we have decided to expand the legal recognition of blockchain as a means of recognizing transfer of ownership on non-listed shares, shares of funds, and also some uh, monetary products that are called a titre de créance négociable. Overall, more uh, than 300 billion euro market for the latest. Shares of funds, I mean, we have tens of uh, billions of uh, euro in assets under management. Even for funds registered in Luxembourg, and that's quite a big share, of course. <laughs> but when it's uh, with, um, I mean, it's beyond EU law, so you can do whatever they are registered, and non-listed shares. And uh, we have seen, developed, through this legal change, done end of 2017, the development of concrete applications. For instance, by asset managers. Because think of asset managers, especially in France, they do not have such a good knowledge of their end clients. Because it goes through the distribution network, for instance, banks, insurers, things like this, and that's the one having the client relationship. But when you have to deal with KYC, for instance, when you have to deal with regulatory requirements, some are on asset managers. And to fulfill this, it's good for them to have some knowledge. Think of what happened, for instance, during this summer with some UK funds regarding liquidity uh, issues. What we discovered at this occasion is that supervisors, regulators, it's quite a mess be, between the one uh, in the UK, in France, when it's a French asset manager, but a UK um, registered um, team, and then you have a kind of Irish or Luxembourgish uh, fund. But anyhow, among those regulators, it was not that clear who had some knowledge about what the statute of the fund had uh, forecasted as liquidity tool management. Think of the use of blockchain in this regard to have quite a registration of all liquidity tools of all funds. And then think of the next issue of a fund having some liquidity issues and then it's possible for any supervisor or regulator involved to have the information to share quite easily and quickly with its counterparts and to act smoothly and to avoid some bigger issues. So from asset management industry side, from a regulatory side, we think that blockchain can bring a lot, a lot of improvements for this kind of industry that has seen its assets under management increased a lot since the financial crisis. And it's now quite a big part of the whole international financial system. So that's one uh, very concrete application that we find very useful. There are two words uh, more about future challenges. The first one 
is that we have a French law. We have a Luxembourgish law. Of course, for financial industry, which is at least European and more probably international, there is probably a need to have soon a European framework. And a European framework designed in a way which enables innovation to put place and innovative applications to, to be in use. So we do not have to be afraid of innovation and regulatory framework to give confidence to the industry in developing such application is the right way forward. I hope that we are able to do this at European level. A second issue, and that's really uh, for you to invent that. Blockchain disintermediate. By doing this, we lose territoriality links. It's hard to say that this blockchain is Luxembourgish, French, Chinese. It's just a network of computers, if you want. It can be located everywhere. But the financial regulation is based on accountability of intermediates that we can locate. So that's quite a challenge for the medium term, I think, but to invent, to reinvent the territorial link also in financial services regulation. My view in this regard, but that's a preliminary view, is that RGPD has given quite a clue by saying it's the consumer, the territorial link, the end consumer in the end. And that has quite an advantage for Europe because one advantage of Europe compared to China or maybe China, but uh, US is that we have a single market which is quite strong with educated people and wealthy people. So maybe that's a way to say, okay, you can do whatever you want with blockchain, which is unterritorial by essence, but regulate not with the territorial location of financial intermediate, but with the location of the end consumer. That's food for food. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Raspier. Effectivement, c'est le défi. Vous, vous avez posé ce défi en des termes très clairs. Et je me tourne maintenant vers Nadia Manzari. Uh, Nadia Manzari is a partner at Shields and Shields. She's uh, practicing law in financial services and fintech, regulatory and compliance. And before joining the firm in uh, 2018, Nadia was the head of the Innovation Payments Market Infrastructure and Governance Department at the Commission de Surveillance du Secteur Financier, CSSF, where she started her career in 2001. So this is very useful for us to have the, someone who has this double experience. Uh, Nadia Monzari, so what is your point of view about the regulatory framework for financial innovation, the Luxembourg point of view, uh, and um, following what has been said by Mr. Raspier? I think the, the position, uh, well, I'll in French, pardon. Um, la position du Luxembourg en matière de, de régulation des, des fintech ou des technologies financières, uh, je pense que notre première approche, c'était, ou c'est toujours, d'avoir, uh, de, de procéder en, en disant, en, l'innovation de par la loi, c'est-à-dire qu'on essaye, on essaye d'un prime abord, d'abord d'appliquer les, les réglementations existantes à des produits innovants. Euh, et je pense que c'est surtout adapté euh, pour les technologies financières, parce qu'à la base, quand on parle de technologies financières, on parle surtout de services financiers, de produits financiers, qui sont souvent les mêmes que, que des services classiques ou traditionnels, mais qui sont prestés d'une manière innovante, et je pense que là, monsieur, euh, 
Prince peut, peut confirmer cela. Et donc, euh, pourquoi devrait-on leur appliquer une nouvelle législation alors que c'est à la base, pour les paiements par exemple, un service de paiement, mais qui est presté par un moyen innovant, une nouvelle technologie Et donc, à la base, en fait, la première approche qu'on a, et qu on, qu on, je pense qui est juste également au niveau des, des technologies financières, c'est d'appliquer la législation existante. Donc, un exemple que j'ai pris, là, c'était justement les paiements. Donc, on, on a maintenant les moyens un moyen de payer par une application mobile, mais à la, à la base, ça reste un moyen de payer. Donc, euh, la décision doit toujours être d'appliquer, selon le principe, également même, même, euh, même business, same business, same risk, same rules. Donc, on applique pour le secteur aussi et pour sauvegarder la compétition, les mêmes règles à ces nouveaux produits. Je pense qu'un exemple... Euh, que M. le ministre vient d'énoncer tout à l'heure également, c'était de, de, quand on a décidé en 2014 d'appliquer la loi paiement également pour les plateformes de crypto-échange. Donc que, comment avons-nous procédé euh, En étudiant justement ce nouveau produit donc, qui permettait de faire des échanges entre crypto-monnaies, on s'est rendu compte auprès du régulateur à l'époque que ces euh, plateformes prestaient également des services, financi euh, services financiers, notamment un service de paiement. Et donc, justement, il était tout à fait juste et tout à fait adapté, et je pense également nécessaire pour maintenir la compétition dans le secteur, de les soumettre à la loi sur les services de paiement. De par là même, on les a automatiquement également soumis aux obligations d'identification de leurs clients, et donc on, on, ils ont été obligés d'appliquer euh, les règles blanchiment, donc AML et, et, et tout le, toutes les procédures de KYC, ce qui, est, qui a, ce qui est exemple qui a été suivi par l'Europe deux ans plus tard pour, pour la directive où ils ont incorporé justement ces acteurs dans les exigences d'obligation de, de, de blanchiment. Donc voilà, je pense que même si à la base, ou de prime abord, un produit peut paraître également encore euh, comment dire, particulièrement innovateur par rapport aux, aux produits existants, il arrive quand même encore qu'on puisse leur appliquer les mêmes réglementations. Je pense qu'il y a les mêmes exemples au, au, au début quand on a traité les... When we, when we, when we had to analyze the, the robot advisory uh, tools, the first questions we had is to, to, to question ourselves, yeah, is it a new product, is it a new service, or is it just a tool to, pro, to provide investment services? And so the, the, the conclusion was, okay, It's a new tool to provide investment services. They have to comply with the existing laws. And the challenges in all this model, c'était surtout de faire le bridge, de faire le pont entre les exigences de la loi et les exigences de la technologie, ou les particularités de la technologie. Donc je pense, et sur, et c'était surtout ça le défi qu'on avait, et je, que, quand les juristes, les avocats aujourd'hui, et quand les régulateurs également, c'est de, de, de trouver un lien ou de parfois vraiment faire des, 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 des connexions, gap the bridge, on dit en anglais, bridge the gap, on dit en anglais, de, de, entre l'innovation, la technologie et la loi. Et, et de par mon expérience, je peux dire que c'est ça aussi qui fait avancer les deux, aussi bien l'interprétation des lois, également le développement des technologies. Donc j'ai très souvent vécu... Euh, ou euh, réaliser qu on, qu on, dans mon ancienne vie en tant que régulateur que qu en discutant avec justement ces, 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 ces nouveaux providers ces, euh, et en discutant avec, avec les développeurs que souvent euh, les, à, à partir des premières discussions on n'était peut-être pas prêt à se comprendre parce qu'on avait différentes attentes également différentes compréhension des concepts mais qu'à et je pense que monsieur Prince you can confirm this we were Uh, working on one of your first fintech products you, you were providing in Luxembourg, the challenge is to find, to, to, to find a, a, a way to, to join, to, de rejoindre les deux, donc les exigences réglementaires et technologiques. Donc euh, voilà, donc c est, c est, je pense la première approche qu'on doit avoir par rapport aux technologies financières, parce que pas n'est tout à 100% innovant. Non, non, c'est pas. Mais euh, M. Raspier a évoqué tout à l'heure euh, l'existence de législation française, luxembourgeoise, et, la, et tout, on sait que la nécessité, c'est aussi d'avoir une réglementation européenne. Alors, puisqu'il n'y a plus de frontières dans ces euh, innovations financières, mais le temps de la législation européenne, le temps d'élaboration de gestation de législation européenne ne semble pas forcément compatible avec la rapidité d'évolution des innovations financières. Donc, qu'est-ce que vous en pensez sur ce point 
Sur ce point, je suis d'accord avec vous, mais en plus, donc, là, donc, je voulais venir justement à la, à, en concluant sur mon premier point. L'avantage au Luxembourg, en ayant eu cette approche et en ayant toujours encore cette approche, c'est que nous évoluons ici au Luxembourg dans un cadre réglementaire essentiellement communautaire et que donc toutes ces solutions-là permettaient aux acteurs également de profiter justement du passeport européen et de déjà prester des services dans d'autres pays euh, communautaires européens. Il est vrai, et je pense que et là où il y a encore un besoin, et où donc les États membres, comme la France et le Luxembourg également, ont légiféré pour des technologies financières, ce sont vraiment des domaines où la loi est soit silencieuse ou que le produit est vraiment innovant. Donc quand on parle de blockchain, ou également peut-être aussi parce qu'il n'y a pas réellement, parce que la blockchain est quand même, reste une technologie quand même informatique, oui, informatique, mais que peut-être pour confirmer cette technologie, il faut prendre une, inter il faut prendre une intervention législative. Et c'est ce que nous avons fait également ici au Luxembourg, en, en, en adoptant la loi du 1er mars 2019, euh, pour, pour justement confirmer que le transfert de titres dans une blockchain est euh, autorisé et également permis. Euh, il est vrai que maintenant, pour, pour euh, pouvoir faire bénéficier ces technologies des mêmes avantages que des produits financiers classiques, euh, une réglementation euh, communautaire euh, serait souhaitée. C est, c est, c est, c est, pour l'Europe, le, pour est en effet euh, une, une nécessité. Je, je vous remercie. Peut-être. Euh, donc, je, je vais maintenant euh, passer la parole à Monsieur Jonathan Prince. Mr. Prince is co-founder and CEO at Phenology, FinTech, RegTech, and partner at Mpulse, Micro Payment and Messaging. And Jonathan uh, is a co-founder. So, uh, and this uh, uh, company um, uh, runs a trusted digital platform that simplifies connectivity between financial institutions and a variety of FinTech solutions. Uh, but maybe I'll let uh, Jonathan explain uh, what does this uh, uh, company And, and because what is au cœur de l'innovation financière. Thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, Minister and Excellency. Um, indeed, um, I think we've, we've been talking about innovation mainly. We've been talking about finance. Um, clearly, the The trend, the current trend, uh, we were talking about change. Um, change is happening. Um, the um, society is evolving also. Uh, Nadia uh, Manzari showed her a smartphone. Uh, that's, that's our new reality. Uh, basically, everything is uh, becoming more and more digital. Um, and of course, the banking sector, the banking industry, the uh, Uh, financial in industry, um, if we look at something wider than just uh, um, retail banking and, and private banking, it goes beyond that. Um, and it evolves in this ecosystem lawyers, it evolves, uh, in, it, it evol involves um, service providers, IT providers. Um, I think that this is a, a situation, we're at a, a tipping point where um, every stakeholder has to think that uh, the people, and in your daily life it's true, you're not acting as you did five or ten years ago. Your life has been impacted by digitization. It has. You don't book a hotel by going in the branch or in an agency, a travel agency anymore. It's not true. Uh, you do it online. You don't... Uh, Uh, book a, a flight by going in, in a travel agency. You don't book anything that way. You're currently using the, um, your, your website, uh, some websites. Uh, and it was true also, and Mr. Gamenya mentioned it, that in the past there were already some, some disruptions. Train came, it changed the way of traveling. You, will, you no longer use horses, you use a train. So basically, um, not going too far, but uh, um, what is happening to the uh, banking industry is clearly a big challenge of adapting 
to new usages, new, new needs. The consumers are expecting to take control of their assets, take control over their assets too. That means that they're going to choose with whom they want to uh, engage and do banking. So this is something that um, has a massive impact on this industry. You will see more and more the banking products and services becoming commodities. If we look at China, um, indeed, WeChat, Alipay, they're not banks. Initially, there were service providers, products, digital products providers, and they included in their products some financial services, some banking services. So you could do savings, you could do payments, but this is becoming a secondary aspect and no longer a primary thing. You don't go, you don't wake up in the morning willing to go to a bank. It's not true. You don't wake up, in, uh, at least unless you work at the bank, but uh, you don't uh, wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to uh, get a mortgage or a loan or pay. You want to buy some water, you want to buy something. That's what you want to do. So, one aspect that is key is that financial institutions are submitted and subject to regulation. So they have to adapt to change in terms of usage, but also make sure that they keep the pace of new regulation. There are new, rule, new laws, new regulations, all, almost on a daily basis. And of course, the pressure of regulation is higher uh, after 2001, 9-11, after the uh, financial crisis. It is increasing and uh, putting a lot of impact and pressure on banks. So the, the, um, the trade-off financial institutions have to do is either they try and develop themselves the solutions, so put resources on implementing new regulation. If it's paper process, it will not be efficient, it will be costly. So the digital option is clearly more cost effective probably more adapted of the need of the employees, of the users. So there, the, the strategic decision they have to make is either build or buy. That's where RegTech players, uh, FinTech startups or, or, or providers come in the game. You were mentioning FinTech as being a threat. Are they going to steal? Are they going to disrupt and get all business and, and make banks disappear. I'm not sure. I'm not sure at all. We, did, we do read in the press, because we love to uh, make ourselves, uh, scare ourselves and say, ooh, the, the, it's, it's going to be massive and we're going to lo lose a lot of jobs. It's not true. Most of the uh, fintech players are working, collaborating with banks, and you did had, have valuations in neobanks who were tremendous, but they're losing money. It is showing the way people want to do banking today, but it is losing money still. The, the startups or the companies who have the better valuations are those who are doing B2B, selling to banks. And one thing I, I, I want to underline is if a bank acquires a startup, it's finished for the innovation because the culture of a bank is clearly not to innovate. A bank is there to manage risk, manage assets. They're not, they have no innovation culture as so, as you expect from what people want today. They, they innovate, of course, but most of the time they have to invest in startups. If they acquire them, it's over, it's finished.
Thank you, Jonathan. Very interesting approach. Tonde Alexander Kachenko, who is the founder and CEO of Venix Exchange, and who is also a Luxembourg serial entrepreneur and an angel investor who funded early stage venture capital fund. So maybe, Alexander, you could uh, yes, explain uh, uh, the, 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 the impact of innovation on the regulatory aspects of financial markets and just react to, to this idea that if a bank uh, acquires a fintech, it is the end of innovation. Because at the same time, you need some money to finance <laughs> financial innovation. So can you uh, let, let you the floor? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll start from answering the question and maybe then later explain what I do. Um, whether it is correct that when the bank acquires a company, the innovation stops, I would tend to agree to it. But I would probably not put just a bank or single it out. I would put a large company. The large companies are structurally uh, made in a way that it is a controlled entity. And therefore... Uh, innovations which are by nature uncontrollable, so this is like going this way or that way, are a threat to the organization and a threat to the stability of the company. Therefore, I think it's only natural that when a large company acquires a small startup, the innovative culture or innovation at the startup dies and it is incorporated. But it's a natural process. Um, what we need to look at is how to promote innovation so that it, it is, um, we have a large number of the startups, we have a large number of the ideas, and we have a large number of the breakthroughs that will feed the development of the companies. In Luxembourg particular case, it's feed the development and strengthening of the financial center. We need to see how the regulator treats the mistakes or the innovative culture of the startups with a bit of leniency and supports that innovation with taking into account that at some point it will support the development of the larger companies. I think that's, that's the key uh, takeaway and this is how I look at it. I run um, an early stage fund which uh, invests or has investments in different areas including blockchain and artificial intelligence and I see how uh, important it is for the startups to actually be at the front of the, uh, of the uh, development, but I also see that in many cases this is going into uncharted territories. And coming back to Jonathan's point, um, large companies and especially institutions which are regulated cannot have a luxury of going to uncharted territories. That's actually the reason why you need both. You need people who are prepared to take risks, sometimes be at the border of what is allowed, and then you have to have a large companies which cater to, to in many cases, uneducated um, customers who require protection from the regulator who would then incorporate those companies into their services and make the services better, more useful, etc., etc. Um, speaking about VNX, VNX is an asset-backed uh, token uh, issuance platform and a trading uh, marketplace. We um, are privileged to have some of the best people in this country as board members or as advisors, including Michael Jackson, who is one of the most famous VC investor, or Dominic Valsquez, uh, who is a former CEO of the Brussels Stock Exchange. I started this company because I saw a niche to um, have to open access to the venture capital investments to the broader uh, in this, uh, to the broader uh, 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 participants. So what we will be doing, we will be issuing tokens that have a link to the performance of the uh, particular assets where venture capital investors invest, and then provide a wide family offices, financial investors, or even the wider public access to those deals. We're launching in uh, three weeks, and the key takeaways that I had by launching the, this platform in Luxembourg is that um, we needed to work with the regulator very closely, 
Uh, but at the same time, when we're speaking about the challenges, is that the regulator needs to understand the technology. Because it is a very interesting new way uh, where the technology is developing. But in order to provide advice or in order to even uh, be a partner, the regulator needs to understand what the technology is. That's the takeaway number two that I think is important both from the regulator but also for me as a manager of the company. Number two, blockchain as a technology is ev evolving. Uh, but it produces... Uh, numerous challenges that the regulator would have to address in the future. For example, our platform eventually would allow uh, automatic KYC. So your KYC would be on the blockchain, and as soon as you've registered with us, we identified who you are. It would allow automatic payment of, for example, proceeds. Uh, we just had a quick discussion with uh, Nadia and the team at ABBL, the Banking Association, on the stable currencies. Um, and that would allow many other things like clearance, depository, et cetera, et cetera, being automatic. But what it means from the regulatory point of view is that machines would be speaking to machines. There will be very, very little human interaction, starting from the registration and to the payout or transition. Meaning that if something goes wrong, who's responsible for it? So that's a very, very complex issue because what we see in our platform eventually in three or four years is that all the transactions are automated. There is very, very little human interference. So how do you regulate it? How do you stop it? How do you unwind it? And what is also quite important, who is responsible? So these are the challenges that the regulator must try to foresee now since the technology is developing, since the platform like ours are developing, this is what will be keeping the uh, regulator kind of awake at night on if something goes wrong, how do we address it? But I think it's important, as I said, for us and for the regulator to work together to address those uh, questions already now. But also what is important is uh, for the regulator, but also for us, to understand that there is a long tail for decisions. In many cases, once a small smart contract is written, for example, what if, and it's embedded, then it stays there for 10 years. And if the regulator at some point decides that, for example, you know, they would like to change something, in many cases it would be extremely costly, and in some cases impossible to modify the smart contracts and the, uh, and the, um, the logic which was built in. Therefore, that's another area that I think uh, both from the technological point of view, but from the regulatory point of view, uh, you as lawyers, but also as regulators, would need to address. Many decisions that are taken now will have a very, very long tail. And many of them will be very costly, if not possible, to amend with the technologies embedded. Uh, but I would welcome anyone who is uh, in Luxembourg in two weeks. There will be a very good event, um, Global Venture Summit. There will be a lot of US VCs coming to Luxembourg. Luxembourg is positioning itself as a very, very, it is a very large financial hub already, but it is also trying to attract VCs. We as a platform are very focused on the VCs and we chose uh, to launch our platform at GVS. If any of you are there, we will be very happy to see you at Global Venture Summit. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Alexander, for, for this um, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so uh, maybe I, I have a, 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 a question um, uh, for you, for, for the member of the, of the panel. Uh, it's, it's about, uh, for example, if you, take, if you take the Libra example, which is uh, uh, l'exemple du Libra uh, de Facebook, it seems to be a big uh, financial innovation. So we, s we realized that it was very difficult to, 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 to see what kind of regulation should apply. Should we create a regulation for this or not? And at the end, it seemed that uh, the, the problem of the Libra is that, uh, I mean, it, it's, it has been rejected because it's not really possible to, to, to identify the proper regulation for it. How would you react uh, on this? Wh 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 why is it so difficult to to, to implement and promote uh, Libra? No. Look, I, I'm not sure it's it's not regulated. In fact, it could be regulated. So, uh, and and I'll, I'll um, 
hand the, the microphone to, to Nadia, who's uh, clearly uh, more expert in, in this matter than I am. But there are uh, cryptocurrencies players. If they want to embrace regulation, they, they can. That's the thing. Um, we're talking about financial sector, uh, so you need to apply, you need to follow specific rules, the financial sector's rules. If you don't, you're not a financial institution. You're something else, right? So Libra, great initiative. I think that banks, the banking industry should look at that carefully because it's a, it's a cryptocurrency. So it's a currency. If it's a currency, then it has to be regulated. And, well, maybe, uh, Nadia, you can, you can add what, what happened in... Je pense que je suis tout à fait d'accord sur ce point. Je pense que euh, Libra, Facebook a déjà une licence en Irlande. Et à mon avis, s'ils avaient voulu le faire vraiment correctement, ils auraient pu euh, faire, en faire une euh, currency ou une, euh, une crypto-monnaie régulée. Je pense que, le, et, et comme Jonathan le dit, et l'exemple que j'ai donné tout à l'heure, c'est justement comment est-ce que je fais pour euh, adapter ma technologie ou mon modèle. Et les banques ont le même problème pour les produits conventionnels. Il faut se conformer à la loi. Je pense que les, le, un des problèmes essentiels de Libra, c'était qu'en fait, leur, 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 leur currency n'était pas stable. Mais s'ils arrivaient réussi à mettre en place un modèle de currency stable, avec une réserve peut-être justement pas basée sur un ensemble de devises, mais une devise unique, je pense qu'on... Bah, C'est juste un exemple d'un des éléments qui, 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 qui a été contesté par la suite pour, par, pour le Libra. Bah, je pense qu'ils aurait auraient déjà été sur la bonne voie pour en faire une, une crypto-monnaie ou une monnaie électronique, parce qu'il y a des lois. La loi sur la monnaie électronique permet tout, permet tout à fait de créer, je vous dirais, une crypto-monnaie qui est à 100% euh, backed, on dit en anglais, par une devise, par un euro ou un dollar. Et, et là, on serait tout à fait dans le cadre réglementaire. Donc, je pense qu'il y a moyen. Don't forget, Facebook has just issued a 30 pages white paper. And I assisted to the conference in Basel where you had all central bankers, regulators. There was one simple question asked five times to Facebook and Libra Association. Who has a claim on the reserve? And they were not able or willing to answer. If you deal with financial regulators, you have to respect the way they do their job by answering their question. So, but I fully agree, you might have answers within the financial regulation for any crypto assets. Then with Libra, and I fully share what you, you said, uh, Nadia, you had also other concerns, monetary one, linked to the fact that it's based on a, uh, different currencies with the ability by Libra Association on its own to change among these currencies, and that's the issue, clearly, the biggest one. But I fully agree also that we have to take that very seriously and to look and examine very carefully because if Libra does not succeed, we will have other uh, project arrangements and then, again, some could bring real benefits. Just finished by this, we, I think there were some doubts at the beginning that the real goal of Libra Association was to bunkerize uh, the unbunkerized, but that's just a presumption. Yeah. Je crois que nous devons malheureusement terminer cette session. Je vous remercie de nous avoir donné ces pistes tout à fait passionnantes pour relever les défis que pose l'innovation dans les services financiers et je vous remercie encore une fois pour votre participation. Donc on va à présent passer au, au second panel. Je vous remercie euh, vraiment ce, 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 nos experts qui nous ont parlé donc des services financiers des, et des nouvelles technologies. 
euh, des métiers euh, cessent, d'autres ré réapparaissent. Maintenant, on va parler des, de la protection, euh, enfin, de notre profession en particulier, de l'intelligence artificielle, euh, de l'éthique peut-être de ces algorithmes euh, également euh, en la matière. J'appelle tous les panélistes du second panel à venir et également les deux modérateurs, les modérateurs à être présents sur scène. Bienvenue dans le deuxième panel consacré à l'innovation dans les services juridiques que j'ai l'honneur de modérer avec Alex Smith et quatre intervenants qui sont des références en la matière. Les Legal Tech sont des start-up de droit en ligne qui proposent aux avocats mais aussi aux justiciables des offres en général 100% numériques. Au départ, il faut bien reconnaître que les Legal Tech n'étaient pas bien vus par les autorités ordinales, les conseils de l'ordre, les bâtonniers. Il y a eu plusieurs procédures judiciaires qui ont été entamées à gauche et à droite pas toujours avec des succès espérés. Aujourd'hui, les Legal Tech ont pris leur place. Elles sont incontournables, elles sont irrésistibles. Les Legal Tech sont aujourd'hui ce qu'étaient aux avocats de hier les bibliothèques. Aux États-Unis, il y a plusieurs centaines de Legal Tech. Au premier rang, Rocket Lawyer, Up Avocat, Law Crazy. En Europe, les plateformes commencent à se développer. Certains clients interrogent déjà les cabinets d'avocats dans des appels d'offres pour savoir avec quel légal tech les cabinets d'avocats travaillent. Et demain, on peut se poser la question si un avocat normalement prudent, raisonnable et diligent peut se dispenser de travailler avec ces légal tech. Il faut en tous les cas que les ordres et les barreaux d'une part et les avocats d'autre part s'intéressent à ces plateformes. Les barreaux, les ordres devraient identifier ces légal tech, les comprendre, dialoguer avec eux et informer le barreau des légal tech qui sont conformes à nos déontologies. Quant aux avocats, nous devons nous intéresser à légal tech collaborer avec elle et dans la mesure où juridiquement c'est possible ou déontologiquement c'est possible, créer, initier ses propres Legal Tech. Alors au niveau de la catégorisation, on distingue généralement trois catégories de Legal Tech. Il y a les premières Legal Tech qui sont de l'intermédiation, de la recherche d'avocats, des annuaires, des plateformes, des marketplaces. Un tiers des Legal Tech actuellement ont cette mission, cet objectif-là. Pour les avocats, c'est essentiel. Ce sont des opportunités de croissance, mettre des avocats en lien entre eux et mettre des avocats en lien avec les clients. Cela pose en tous les cas déjà deux problèmes. Un premier, la problématique de, du booking des avocats et des notations avec les référencements. On a constaté en matière hôtelière que les bookings avaient un pouvoir énorme sur l'industrie. Et on peut comparer avec le barreau. Cela donne un apport moyen de 20% de chiffre d'affaires dans les hôtels grâce à cette appréciation faite par des tiers, les utilisateurs. Autre conséquence du booking, c'est l'augmentation des prix, le remplissage des hôtels qui a considérablement augmenté et les services qui se sont améliorés. Ce booking, cette notation, génère du chiffre d'affaires, générera du chiffre d'affaires pour les cabinets de l'avocat de la marge et du remplissage. Deuxième problématique, quid de la déontologie au regard de la rémunération des apporteurs d'affaires et du partage d'honoraires Doit-on maintenir l'interdiction qui existe dans la plupart de nos barreaux sur ce partage de rémunération 
alors que la plupart du temps, on l'autorise ce partage quand il est question de partage entre avocats et alors que dans d'autres barreaux, on contourne cette interdiction par une participation aux frais de ces plateformes. Voilà les premières catégories de Legal Tech. Deuxième catégorie, la production de documents et de services juridiques, les smart contracts, les conseils donnés aux clients à l'aide de l'intelligence artificielle et des services, les chatbox. Nos clients, demain, exigeront que nous ayons une connaissance de ces marchés, ces technologies, permettent sans doute de passer moins d'heures de travail, moins d'heures à facturer et à timesheeter à l'égard des clients et elles permettent sans doute de fournir plus efficacement des services juridiques à nos clients. Dernière catégorie de Legal Tech, elle nous intéresse au premier plan puisqu'elle sera développée par nos différents intervenants, c'est l'aide à la décision. C'est le stockage des informations, c'est la documentation du type Doctrine.fr et des autres Legal Tech représentés ici. C'est un outil rétrospectif des décisions de justice pour essayer d'avoir de la prédictivité. Prédictivité pour aider les avocats à prendre des décisions, de nous aider à évaluer les risques et de conseiller ou non à nos clients d'initier des procédures judiciaires avec toute la problématique du shopping des magistrats. On en reparlera dans l'atelier du samedi après-midi sur l'intelligence artificielle. Aider les juges à prendre une décision ou pourquoi pas euh, prendre la décision à la place des juges puisqu'il est question déjà de robotisation de la justice. Voilà cette brève introduction. Je laisse alors le soin à Alex de présenter nos différents intervenants. Voilà, merci, euh, <coughs> Monsieur le Bâtonnier, je peux dire. So, Jean-Pierre, uh, I present you as the, the first uh, person. Uh, Jean-Pierre is uh, avocat au barreau de Bruxelles. Uh, he's the founder of Boy Legal, which is uh, a very renowned Belgian law firm. He has had a long career at the bar uh, as a, a member of various commissions. He has been putting in a lot of energy to uh, make the Brussels bar evolve, and he finished as batonnier, which is uh, the consecration for a lawyer. He's also a teacher. He has uh, been teaching at uh, ULB uh, for many, many years. Uh, in that capacity also, he's a, a publisher because he publishes uh, regularly Uh, on uh, legal uh, subjects, and uh, he's finally also a member, a board member of many uh, companies and also associations. I keep it short because otherwise, voila. Then the next person to my left always is um, uh, Ian. Uh, Ian is the uh, executive vice president and general counsel of LexisNexis. I don't think that I have to present LexisNexis to the lawyers here in the room. They know probably LexisNexis. Uh, uh, Ian, you had an interesting career because uh, you, uh, before being in the position that you are in now, you were working, uh, working in England at uh, uh, the, the, the biggest telecom company, if I'm correct. And then you uh, did some work uh, for um, the, um, uh, the Hughes Electronics, huh, which was a subsidiary of General Uh, electric and uh, but you are, and then I saw also on the I went on the web <laughs> I saw also that you are uh, lecturing quite a lot uh, that you are also participating on a number of academic projects in the United States at Yale if I'm not wrong and uh, finally uh, and I, I will <laughs> cut it off with that uh, you uh, are not only a judge in the barristers disciplinary tribunal but you also are very interested in sports and you are a commentator on on cricket, uh, on the radio, voila. Uh, then uh, we have Vincent, Vincent, uh, I had another order, Vincent, <coughs> he is, um, Vincent, I checked a little bit uh, your side, uh, you are uh, a chief, you, you, <laughs> you are described as a chief digital uh, content officer of, um, of, uh, of, uh, Voilà, voilà, Voltos Kluver, which is, everybody knows Voltos Kluver also here, you can also get there beyond outside. And uh, you have always been very interested in uh, applying also for the Brussels Bar. Yeah, 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 yeah,
yes. And you have always been very interested in uh, adopting new uh, processes like uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the, the, the natural uh, language uh, programming, uh, which is uh, that, you, like, like my doctor, you, he has the computer on and he speaks, you know, and he gives everything to the computer. Uh, and you are leading, uh, right now, you are leading a team of about uh, 40 people at Kluvers who are uh, legal and uh, technology experts, and you try to develop new systems for our profession. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, and then we have uh, <coughs> Michael Rigali. Michael Rigali, uh, he's uh, working here in Luxembourg as a senior enterprise content management consultant, and he's also team leader uh, at NSI uh, Pixelixir, uh, which is a company specialized in pr the provision of uh, technological solutions uh, to private uh, companies, <coughs> private individuals, but also to <coughs> Uh, to public regulators, and uh, I cannot I cannot cite all the the uh, governmental institutions that you have been working for here in Luxembourg, but you have a very nice rooster of uh, people that you are advising here in Luxembourg. And then uh, we have uh, our speaker. Where is our speaker? Voila. We have our, our initial speaker, Dan Korn, uh, who has something religious about him, because in his description, uh, he says that uh, he is an evangelist, uh, a digital evangelist. So when I read that, uh, I went again. I had to go on. <laughs> Uh, what I saw, that, the, that it is a, a religious origin, it's a religious origin, because what we are doing basically is to uh, put together communities that are going to use systems that you want to sell and that you want to become the norm in a certain sector. Is that c c correct? And you work for the French company CSIP, and CSIP, you see, Solution pour Avocat, uh, so I don't have to present the company, you can get everything outside again on the stand. Voilà. Uh, pardon? <laughs> no, 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 no. Voilà. Uh, well, uh, should we say uh, you start and you give us a short, or short, medium short introduction? Voila. And then afterwards, we will have the other panelists come in turn by turn and. Uh, put up a little bit, comment a little bit, and then hopefully we will wrap it up with some interesting uh, questions uh, about fear, uh, for instance. <laughs> okay, and I, I was also, my legitimate, I was also the, the first uh, associate of uh, the first uh, startup, low startup in France in uh, 2012 and 2013. And we don't talk about legal tech. Um, we talk only about startup. And when, when we say legal tech, there was a decision uh, qui a, on va dire, divisé. C'est-à-dire, en gros, ça a créé des clivages. Puisqu'on a pensé que tout de suite, la legal tech était une startup qui allait sur le métier de l'avocat et donc qui allait prendre des parts de marché sur le métier de l'avocat. Uh, je suis embêté parce que... Uh, Jean-Pierre Jean Boyle uh, tells everything about legal tech, so have uh, no uh, add value. Uh, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try and just talk um, talk about uh, when innovation meets passion, but meets also excitation, because uh, it's a great opportunity for you to reinvent your work, to rethink about the way to address your clients also and your market and how you manage your teams and how you use technology. So I will talk about all these things now, okay? With the uh, image. So, but. I put on, put on it. Yes, I'm an um, evangelist. You see with my hands like that, it's a, uh, okay. Um, I put on my glasses uh, it's my, uh, to develop my artificial intelligence. It's, it's, it's better for me. Uh, so, bonjour à tous, uh, buenas dias, uh, good morning, uh, good morning, ni hao. Uh, J'adore uh, l'UIA parce que uh, l'UIA, en fin de compte, il y a beaucoup de, un foisonnement de culture et il y a beaucoup de langage. On va essayer ce matin avec uh, tous les intervenants et tous uh, mes confrères donc de parler d'une seule langue qui est celle en fait de la legal tech et d'une culture en fait qui est celle de l'innovation, qui est une grande culture. 
vous vous rappelez tous de cette image hein, pour certains, certaines, enfin certaines par certains. Euh, en fait, votre prestation de serment, vous, vous avez prêté serment pour euh, exercer votre métier avec probité, dignité, humanité, conscience, indépendance, transparence. Euh, équité, égalité et euh, non, euh, non discrimination. Euh, vous allez tous avoir bientôt votre propre intelligence artificielle aussi, votre agent conversationnel, qui lui aussi prêtera serment, comme déjà chez l'éditeur de logiciels SAP, où il y a déjà un code éthique qui existe pour l'intelligence artificielle, parce qu'on veut réguler et encadrer l'intelligence artificielle, parce que à un moment donné, ça va engager la responsabilité de l'avocat. Et surtout, on veut essayer de comprendre dans l'intelligence artificielle, parce qu'elle va prêter serment. L'intelligence artificielle va prêter serment avec dignité, probité, avec aussi sa responsabilité, mais pas sa conscience et pas son humanité. C'est ce qu'ils nous disent aussi encore pour l'instant de l'intelligence artificielle. Mais ce qui est intéressant, ce qui est intéressant en fait, si vous voulez, c'est que par rapport à l'intelligence... Un peu moins vite, d'accord. Oui, c'est pour la traduction. Ouais, ok, donc je vais parler moins vite pour la traduction. Donc, ce que... Excusez-moi, ce que c'est l'intelligence émotionnelle qui prend le dessus, là. Euh, et, et donc, en fait, l'intelligence artificielle, si vous voulez, est un véritable atout et une véritable opportunité pour vous. Sans forcément passer de l'avocat de l'ancien monde à l'avocat, entre guillemets, du nouveau monde, comment, on va dire, aujourd'hui, on est avocat Et comment, aujourd'hui, en tant qu'avocat, on a aussi prêté serment, et on prête serment aujourd'hui, pour adresser son marché avec le sens de la relation client, avec l'aide de solutions technologiques, justement, pour être beaucoup plus efficient. Intelligence artificielle, avocat augmenté, Legal Tech, il y a beaucoup de grands concepts. On parle beaucoup aujourd'hui de l'avocat connecté. L'avocat connecté n'est plus ni moins, en fin de compte, qu'un avocat aujourd'hui qui est en lien avec sa juridiction, avec son instance, avec ses collaborateurs, avec son marché, avec ses clients. L'avocat augmenté, l'intelligence artificielle, je vais vous démontrer un petit peu de manière peut-être un peu simpliste euh, ce que ça veut vraiment dire. Moi, je parlerais plutôt pour l'intelligence de l'intelligence de l'avocat. En effet, aujourd'hui, ce qui est extrêmement intéressant, c'est que il n'y a pas une scission, il n'y a pas une opposition entre l'avocat d'un côté et la Legal Tech de l'autre. Aujourd'hui, il y a une vraie complémentarité. C'est-à-dire qu'en entre guillemets, on s'appuie sur l'expertise métier d'un avocat et derrière, on va bâtir un socle technologique. Donc, la technologie va simplement être un levier, un canal, un moyen, justement, une assistance, une aide à la décision, mais... Avant tout, c'est l'avocat qui, lui, va prendre sa responsabilité et va être beaucoup plus productif et efficient, justement, aujourd'hui, par rapport à une problématique client. Comment ça se comporte ben, C'est très simple. C'est qu'aujourd'hui, l'avocat, ben, il fait beaucoup de tâches. Et il fait des tâches aussi à faible valeur ajoutée. Et il a un peu dépassé parce qu'il est dans ses dossiers, ce qui est tout à fait normal. Donc, il demande de l'aide. Et par rapport à ça, quand il demande de l'aide, eh l'intelligence artificielle ne va pas prendre votre place. Pas du tout, au contraire. Elle va simplement vous permettre justement de vous concentrer sur des tâches à forte valeur ajoutée et par rapport à la facturation justement sur des honoraires à plus-value. Et comment ça va se passer eh C'est très simple. C'est qu'en gros, on ne va plus parler vraiment aujourd'hui d'intelligence artificielle, mais on va plus parler d'intelligence artificielle. Augmenter. Aujourd'hui, c'est la terminologie qui, est le plus, euh, qui, va, qui va le plus dans ce sens. Et quand, du coup, on parle d'intelligence augmentée et qu'on l'applique à l'avocat, bah, tout simplement, qu'est-ce que ça va donner Un avocat, quand il revient et qu'il enlève sa robe, bah, l'avocat, entre guillemets, ça va être un avocat qui va être augmenté. Pourquoi Parce qu'il aura des solutions, en fait, si vous voulez, d'analytics, de pilotage, des tableaux de bord, des indicateurs, euh, des outils de workflow de collaboratif, de traitement de la donnée et de prédictibilité. Donc en fait, ce n'est pas un avocat connecté, ce n'est pas un avocat augmenté, c'est simplement un avocat qui vit aujourd'hui en 2019, c'est-à-dire on replace l'avocat dans un contexte global, un avocat qui est un acteur économique et qui grâce à l'intelligence artificielle et grâce à la technologie va avoir une plus grande attractivité aujourd'hui sur son marché et va devenir un stratégiste. Pourquoi Parce que, mesdames et messieurs, vous êtes des stratégistes. Parce que vous allez délivrer aujourd'hui une stratégie pour votre client, que ce soit en juridique ou en judiciaire. Et donc forcément, la technologie va vous aider d'y parvenir et va valoriser aussi votre fonction parce que forcément, ça va démontrer beaucoup plus rapidement votre expertise. La Legal Tech. Legal Tech, c'est extrêmement intéressant. Euh, la Legal Tech. En gros, aujourd'hui, euh, la Legal Tech, depuis 2016, il y a eu beaucoup d'évangélisation de la part de vos instances. 
euh, qui ont fait en sorte qu'à un moment donné, vous ayez pu avoir une acculturation pour comprendre l'intérêt de la Legal Tech et comment s'approprier la Legal Tech par rapport à votre ancrage local, par rapport à vos clients, par rapport au domaine du droit que vous exercez, par rapport à vos problématiques. Je ne vais pas essayer de vous convaincre, mais simplement vous dire qu'aujourd'hui, la Legal Tech est une formidable chance, une opportunité pour vous. C'est un levier de croissance pour vos cabinets d'avocats. Pourquoi Parce qu'aujourd'hui, tous les signaux sont au, sont au vert. Le marché est structuré quand même depuis de, de nombreuses années. Le marché avant était complètement éclaté et atomisé avec tous les acteurs qui adressaient le marché, dont les avocats aussi, hein, des avocats, des notaires, des huissiers, des experts comptables, des directeurs juridiques, des entreprises comme nous qui adressent votre marché. Donc on fait tous partie un peu d'un écosystème et bien sûr, l'avocat peut s'emparer de la technologie et s'en servir pour à un moment donné traduire une expertise et transformer une loi du législateur en opportunité de marché et transformer cette opportunité de marché en technologie pour dire à la fin, coucou, je suis là, moi je suis avocat, j'ai une expertise, une compétence et simplement la technologie sera, comme je vous dis, simplement le canal. Ensuite, euh ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'il y a eu beaucoup de concepts. On a beaucoup parlé d'IA ou de Legal Tech. Il y a eu des, beaucoup de concepts pendant des années. Et ça y est, maintenant, aujourd'hui, l'avocat est prêt. C'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, maintenant, on est dans des solutions concrètes. L'avocat veut voir. C'est pour ça que dans des salons de la Legal Tech à New York, à Londres ou même à Paris, quand les gens viennent maintenant, certes, ils vont dans les conférences, mais ils sont en attente. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, on leur parle tellement d'outils qu'aujourd'hui, ils veulent savoir ce que c'est la blockchain. Ils veulent savoir ce que c'est qu'à un moment donné du traitement de la donnée. Ils veulent savoir à un moment comment valoriser leur patrimoine incorporel du cabinet d'avocat. Et pour ce faire, c'est pas qu'ils ne veulent pas y aller. Ils veulent y aller, mais ils veulent comprendre, s'informer et, entre guillemets, évoluer et s'adapter au changement. Et une fois qu'ils ont compris le changement, ils vont pouvoir l'intégrer et le déployer en interne dans leur structure et fédérer aussi les équipes. Autre chose aujourd'hui, euh, la Legal Tech permet d'accélérer grâce au législateur justement des nouvelles opportunités de business parce qu'à partir du moment où le législateur va réguler sur certains sujets par exemple comme la blockchain en France, ça va permettre à des sociétés d'adresser le marché, de délivrer des solutions technologiques et à des avocats dans toute l'égalité de s'en emparer pour le transformer en business model. Donc ça, extrêmement important, la Legal Tech s'accélère par vos clients parce qu'ils sont en demande, parce qu'aujourd'hui vos clients sont en demande d'acheter des solutions de low tech. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, vos clients savent que c'est vous qui avez l'expertise, mais ils savent qu'ils auront peut-être, que vous irez peut-être plus vite grâce à la technologie. Et en même temps, le législateur, comme je vous ai dit, va vous permettre d'y arriver beaucoup plus facilement. Et aussi parce qu'il y a une concurrence. Et la concurrence, c'est sain, parce qu'à un moment donné, la concurrence, c'est ce qui fait le marché. C'est-à-dire que vous, à un moment donné, vous avez vu des acteurs arriver sur votre marché, vous avez observé, vous avez vécu ça peut-être comme une menace et non pas comme une opportunité. Vous avez compris, vous avez compris que vous aussi, grâce à votre déontologie, dont parlait Maître Boyle, vous aviez un avantage concurrentiel que n'ont pas les autres acteurs. Et vous vous êtes dit, ben nous aussi, finalement, on est la Legal Tech et nous aussi, nous allons concevoir des solutions Legal Tech pour nos clients. Donc, ça, avec ça, je ne vous ai pas convaincu, mais je continue quand même un petit peu. Euh, ce qui est intéressant aussi, c'est que la Legal Tech, forcément, cette transformation digitale, en fait, cette injection de Legal Tech dans vos cabinets, va aussi faire en sorte que ça va être une vraie transition humaine à l'intérieur dans votre organisation. Pourquoi Parce que ça va injecter de la transversalité. Et quand on parle de transformation digitale, en fait, on parle beaucoup d'agilité et on parle beaucoup d'innovation collaborative, en fait, et d'intelligence collective. C'est exactement tout ça, ce que, ce que va te contribuer la Legal Tech. Donc, ça va décloisonner votre cabinet qui était un peu pyramidal et ça va faire en sorte à un moment donné de l'horizontaliser et d'intégrer tout le monde dans la chaîne de valeur. Vos collaborateurs, vos assistants, vos secrétaires, vos clients, vos partenaires, vos fournisseurs. À un moment donné, il faut écouter tout le monde et donc il faut y aller. Il ne faut pas se poser de questions parce que comme je vous ai dit, les solutions sont robustes, les solutions sont matures, vos clients sont en attente, le législateur vous donne le go, on dérégule un petit peu, on met une déontologie forte pour que vous puissiez y parvenir. Donc aujourd'hui, je ne vois pas que pourquoi et comment l'avocat ne pourrait pas basculer en entrepreneur du droit. La Legal Tech. On a demandé, nous, aux avocats, leur perception de la Legal Tech. Entre guillemets, eux, ce qu'ils nous disent, la Legal Tech, majoritairement, oui, c'est la technologie, stricto sensu, appliquée au droit. Ensuite, c'est un écosystème dont ils font partie, et ils ont entièrement raison, et ce sont peut-être aussi pour certains des start-up du droit, ça y est, euh, j'aurais posé cette question il y a 4 ans, tout le monde aurait dit, c'est des start-up, ou c'est des braconniers, ou c'est des vilains qu'on va attaquer parce qu'ils adressent notre marché. Ben non, avant, l'avocat avait le monopole, aujourd'hui, forcément, ben, ça s'ouvre un petit peu, vous avez un marché qui est 
a, qui a une forte intensité concurrentielle. Donc voilà. Donc a, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que maintenant, vous êtes dans une démarche constructive et positive tournée vers l'avenir avec une quête de sens, c'est-à-dire que vous voulez bien déployer des outils, mais vous voulez comprendre le bénéfice et mesurer aujourd'hui la valeur ajoutée des solutions technologiques et d'intelligence artificielle que vous allez déployer dans votre organisation. Ensuite, ils ont dit que c'était un juriste augmenté. Ben oui, comme on l'a vu précédemment, ils allaient être augmentés tout simplement par la technologie. Enfin, on leur a demandé et ils nous ont dit, ben oui, en gros, ça va déplacer notre valeur ajoutée. Ben forcément, parce qu'il y a plein de tâches qu'ils faisaient, ben, qui vont être remplacées un petit mo un, par, un, par, par l'apprentissage d'algorithmes ou de machines. Bon, mais alors, ben, c'est pas grave. C'est une occasion justement pour un avocat qui a 5 ans, 10 ans, 15 ans, 20 ans de barreau de se renouveler et de faire d'autres choses. Et ben, tant mieux. Et comme ça, il va pouvoir se concentrer sur des tâches à forte valeur et même inventer des nouvelles prestations de droit aussi grâce à la technologie. Enfin, valoriser sa fonction, bah oui, parce que grâce à la technologie, on va démontrer beaucoup plus rapidement son expertise et à un plus grand nombre grâce au numérique, parce qu'aujourd'hui, c'est comme ça que ça se passe. L'avocat, il y a la marque avocat, il y a une forte confiance aujourd'hui dans l'avocat, mais l'avocat doit développer sa confiance digitale et sa confiance numérique. Parce que même si monsieur qui est au premier rang, qui est au premier rang j'ai une entière confiance en lui, si je le rencontre et que j'ai enfin un rendez-vous physique, en présentiel, je vais quand même aller le googliser pour corroborer son expertise et voir ce qu'il m'a dit est vrai. Donc, Aujourd'hui, ça se passe un petit peu comme ça. Les usages. Alors, euh, Maître Boyle en a parlé un petit peu. Oui, oui j'ai. Maître Boyle en a parlé un petit peu. Donc, les usages de la Legal Tech, l'analyse du Big Data, forcément, euh, les échanges sécurisés, le chiffrement, la sécurité, un enjeu très important sur la cybercriminalité, le stockage de documents, l'analyse de contrats et un meilleur accès aux droits. J'avance sur des slides un peu plus intéressantes. On a demandé à, aux clients des avocats, selon vous, Qu'est-ce qui serait intéressant qu'un avocat vous propose Les clients des avocats ont dit le paiement en ligne, un espace d'échange client, un générateur de contrat automatique, parce qu'à la rigueur, ils savent que derrière, il y a la responsabilité de l'avocat qui s'engage, il y a une vraie expertise. Donc, ils sont prêts peut-être, en effet, à acheter un générateur de contrat automatique et à devenir client du cabinet d'avocats, libre après à l'avocat d'apporter sa plus-value sur le conseil ou sur le contentieux, et enfin sur des espaces collaboratifs. Par exemple, regardez des avocats qui ont entrepris dans ce domaine. Là, certes, on dirait peut-être une boutique en ligne, hein, ce n'est pas un commerçant, mais maître Patrick Lingibé, qui est l'avocat de Juris Guyane et qui est bâtonnier de Cayenne et est bâtonnier de la conférence des Dom -tom, eh ben, il propose une vraie expérience client aujourd'hui, puisqu'il propose du paiement, de la consultation en ligne, de la prise de rendez-vous, des documents juridiques, des annonces immobilières, un espace privilégié et à droite, il maîtrise son image sur les réseaux sociaux. Ensuite, vous avez Uplo. Uplo, il ne parle pas d'avocat. À aucun moment, ils disent nos horaires, nos, nos, nos honoraires. À aucun moment, ils disent nos matières. En fait, ils parlent de fonctionnalités Uplo pour expliquer ce qu'ils font. Et donc, forcément, ben, ils sont là, ils disent qu'on est une égale tech d'avocats. Je prends par exemple Numétic Avocat. Numétic Avocat a très bien compris que, tiens, finalement, en, faisant, en permettant à ses clients de faire du dépôt de documents, de droits d'auteur, de dessins, de modèles sur son site web, eh ben, elle pouvait capter une clientèle, même pour 10 euros, mais elle fait du volume, mais elle sait que la personne se dira, je suis client du cabinet parce que j'ai déposé chez lui un document, je suis en toute confiance dans ce cabinet d'avocat-là, et si j'ai un contentieux par rapport à ma marque ou par rapport à mon dépôt, j'ai un cabinet qui va s'occuper de moi. Et donc derrière, on va aller vers le conseil. Et si cette entreprise a un problème de contentieux sur sa marque, elle sait aussi qu'elle a, a un avocat, pas un avocat à 10 euros, mais un avocat qui lui a permis à un moment donné d'avoir un point d'entrée supplémentaire grâce à la technologie. Si je prends par exemple FTPA, maintenant vous avez deux cabinets en France qui ont lancé des offres blockchain. Un cabinet qui s'appelle FTPA et un autre cabinet qui s'appelle Jacob Avocat qui lui a fait du legal design pour expliquer le process avec un huissier justement pour certifier en termes d'eurodatage et de cryptographie ben, pourquoi c'est important à un moment donné de déposer chez un avocat les documents. Vous voyez que finalement la technologie lui permet. Et enfin, il reste deux minutes, juste pour vous dire que quand je vous dis que le législateur à un moment légifère et que c'est une opportunité pour les avocats, en France on a été le premier pays en Europe il y a deux ans à avoir légiféré sur la, la gestion du registre des titres euh, donc ce qu'on appelle la titrisation en fait par la blockchain. Ça a permis quoi Ça a permis finalement qu'il y ait des avocats qui montent des plateformes justement pour gérer le registre de titres par le numérique avec la blockchain et il y a la première opération immobilière en France qui s'est faite cet été sur l'achat d'un hôtel euh, particulier avec deux cabinets d'avocats, une étude de notaire, un fonds d'investissement et une technologie blockchain justement sur la gestion du registre des titres. Donc vous voyez finalement on parle du légal, on revient sur le légal et simplement le numérique va accélérer une prise de position sur le marché. Et les différents usages maintenant des familles de la Legal Tech et de l'IA, c'est celle-ci. La preuve, la propriété intellectuelle, la protection des données. Ensuite, le chiffrement et la sécurité. 
enfin, ici, tout ce qui est contrat intelligent et contract management. Le big data, donc traitement de la donnée et analyse des prédictibilités. Tout ce qui est moteur de graphe, moteur intelligent pour contextualiser le droit, justement, pour avoir une meilleure compréhension. Et enfin, ici, tout ce qui est collaboratif, workflow et ce qu'on appelle practice, practice management. Et enfin, regardez quand même ce qui est hallucinant. Hein. On a demandé à vos clients, une minute, je sais, une minute, on a demandé à vos clients s'ils étaient prêts à souscrire à des prestations chez un avocat à partir du moment où l'avocat disait que celle-ci a été réalisée par une intelligence artificielle. Vous rendez-vous compte quand même que là, vos clients sont prêts finalement à acheter chez vous parce qu'ils ont confiance, parce qu'en fait, c'est de votre cabinet. Donc, c'est l'IA de votre cabinet, c'est votre responsabilité. Donc, par l'apprentissage, c'est votre base de connaissances qui a été intégrée. Et donc, OK, ils sont prêts, en effet, à y aller pour la rédaction de documents, pour la consultation juridique, un peu pour l'assignation, pour la recherche documentaire. Donc, finalement, on voit aujourd'hui qu'il y a une certaine maturité aussi, ben, finalement, de vos clients. Mais, mes confrères, ici, ont parlé de la data. Donc, ce qui est extrêmement important, voyez la data aujourd'hui comme un actif immatériel. Voyez la data aujourd'hui, aujourd'hui, ce qui valorise votre cabinet d'avocat. Hein. Moi, je vais vous dire un truc, il y a trois choses. Votre savoir-faire, la donnée, une donnée structurée, ordonnée, dans votre cabinet d'avocat. Et finalement, derrière aussi, bah, du coup, votre notoriété, votre marque, votre réputation et votre image. Et si vous n'avez pas une base de données structurée aujourd'hui, la valorisation de l'actif immatériel de votre cabinet ne vaut rien. C'est pour ça que si vous concentrez aujourd'hui vos efforts sur la technologie, sur la data, c'est extrêmement important parce que ça va vous valoriser, ça va valoriser votre fonction, votre cabinet d'avocat. Et n'hésitez pas sur votre site internet à dire que vous avez de la technologie. N'hésitez pas à lister les solutions technologiques que vous avez pour montrer à vos clients que vous êtes un avocat différenciant par rapport à un autre parce que vous avez fait le choix d'investir sur la technologie. Et juste pour finir, puisque je laisse justement la parole là-dessus aux autres personnes, j'avais compté 20 minutes, il reste 3 minutes. Pardon Il reste 2 minutes, mais je... Oui, mais je crois que... Juste, juste sur une chose, et je finis là-dessus. Oui. Juste pour vous dire que voilà. Je vous vois tous comme des avocats conquérants aujourd'hui. Mais pour être un avocat co conquérant, en fait, dans la salle, simplement, ce qui se passe, c'est que pour certains, ici, la Legal Tech, c'est une montagne. C'est une montagne. Et sauf que pour certains d'entre vous, une fois que vous avez franchi cette montagne, ben vous allez avoir de l'oxygène grâce à la Legal Tech. Parce que vous allez pouvoir vous concentrer justement sur plusieurs tâches. Et c'est pas parce qu'à un moment donné, il faut être bien équipé qu'on veut franchir une montagne. Et ce n'est pas avec les tongs de la justice, entre guillemets, qu'on va y arriver. Simplement, l'avantage, c'est qu'avec tous les acteurs qu'il y a autour de la table ici, on a en capacité de vous aider et de vous donner les bons équipements, justement, pour vous aider à franchir des sommets. Parce qu'à un moment donné, peut-être que monsieur voudra aller ici, madame là, ou monsieur qui est ici, à ce sommet. Donc, en gros, tout ça, ça fait partie du changement. Ce changement, on va en parler. Je vous remercie. Voilà. Et retrouvez-nous samedi, en effet, pour une grande conférence sur l'intelligence artificielle. Merci à tous. Voilà, bravo. Euh, je comprends maintenant pourquoi on vous appelle l'évangéliste. Euh, euh, vous prêchez avec conviction. Euh, Vincent, we said that you would follow up on the initial presentation. Uh, you have five minutes, you remember. Three. Yes, no, I will indeed. I will indeed be very uh, short. Um, I'd like to make a couple of uh, key points to, to complement what we say earlier, which was uh, very interesting. Um, first of all, my, my current function is, was originally titled Head of Predictive Analytics uh, Products. And uh, I, have, I am now only using the term Head of Legal Analytics because I do not believe that the term predictive, uh, that's one thing that I, one of the points that I would like to, to highlight, that the term predictive actually really captures what it is that is being done. I think that the challenge here and the opportunity that is provided by technology and IA and, and such, um, you know, artificial intelligence and other uh, approaches is to have an empirical interaction with data meaning that what technology gives you is a kind of a reasoned, empirical representation of what is actually going on. And of course, you can try from there to predict what might happen, but it's not the technology itself which is going to predict what is going to happen. What will happen will be what you do 
with the information. That's what's going to happen, right? And I think that's very important not to uh, to get lost in that because a lot of a lot of uh, articles that are written uh, about that by uh, professors and and so on uh, tend to sort of keep saying, well, you know, it's not about, you know, nobody's going to be able to predict this and we don't want to relinquish the control of who makes decisions and things like that. That's not the thing. That's not the challenge. Nobody is trying to predict, you know, what is actually going to happen. However, what matters is that you get the data, the information, the interactions, which help you make decisions so that things will happen. Uh, I'm, I think I, the fan, fundamental philosophical position that we cannot predict the future uh, is is the only sound and rational one. So that's that's the, on, on the high level. On the concrete level, I wanted to bring a couple of practical practical uh, points and uh, and pointers. I want to say that I, I like the title between passion and reason uh, because it's precisely that's the tension that we have. So you have the passion, which is the passion of the law, of the practice of law, of what it is to kind of solve legal problems and so on. That's where the passion comes from, what it means to be a lawyer or a legal professional. And indeed, the reason comes through this question of data and empirical approach of, uh, of things. Now, the key is that the, um, the every IA uh, project, every you know, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence project, AI I should say, uh, project is really an innovation. Why? Because it requires a, a, a complete modelization of a particular problem. And that's where your passion can come in as a, as a legal professional, is the modelization of your legal problem is where, I, well, that's one of the things I find the most exciting personally, is where your personal expertise is going to come to bear. It's about how I have this problem, I know or I have an intuition that some technological approach might help me kind of perform better or uh, do a better job with it or get, uh, get more value out of this process. But the first question I have to ask myself is, how am I going to formalize this particular expert workflow or process that I'm doing so that it becomes accessible to some kind of technology? Because technology has to be applied on a formal thing. And you need to be able to formalize the piece of the expertise that you're trying to uh, address by a technology. And I find that very interesting. And that's why it's always innovative, because we find from, uh, from interacting with lawyers to kind of uh, design products and so on, that the process of figuring out what exactly is that uh, workflow is often a new process, actually, for the professional themselves i.e. we all do our jobs in a way which contains a lot of implicit things, a lot of you know, ways of doing things which we just, you know, we learned many, many years ago, we do things because, well, that's the way it's done today. But the minute you want to formalize and apply technology to that process, you have to think about it again. And I find that that's, the, that's where the passion meets the reason. The technology itself is not critical, although it is the, the choices that you will make there are very fundamental, and they will be essentially determined by how you model this process that you want to apply technology to. I want to bring that as, as one of the key practical uh, points, and I'll stop there, is that the way you think about the process that you want to improve is going to have a direct impact, and the way you're able to explain that to the technologists with whom you're going to be working is going to be a direct impact with the kinds of choices that the technology people are going to have to make. Which algorithm to use, which, not which algorithm, which you know, succession of many algorithms to use is going to be entirely determined by the way you explain or you think through and modelize the process that you're trying to apply technology to. So that's, if there's one point that I want to make, it's going to be this one. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> very interesting, the points about predictability, uh, and uh, I hope that we have the time to come back because I have a few questions that I would like to test maybe. Voila. Uh, Michael, would you be kind enough to... Uh, Come in from your side now, please. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Comme expliqué par Jean-Pierre, moi je travaille pour une société qui met en place des solutions d'automatisation avec l'ajout d'intelligence artificielle. Donc, comme souvent chez, chez mes clients, l'intelligence artificielle fait peur. Donc, vous, dans votre cas, vous imaginez que l'intelligence artificielle pourra un, un jour vous remplacer. Mais comme expliqué par, par Dan, L'intelligence artificielle n'est pas là pour vous remplacer, mais pour vous aider dans les tâches de tous les jours et permettre justement de faire des tâches à valeur plus ajoutée. Donc ici, mes clients ont toujours une, une crainte au niveau de, de l'ajout de l'intelligence artificielle au niveau de projet. 
Mais ensuite, ils se rendent compte que ben, ça permet à, leur, à leurs employés de pouvoir faire d'autres tâches, de, de limiter les tâches répétitives à faire euh, à la mise en place de robots. Donc ici, principalement l'intelligence artificielle liée à la capture de données, qui est aussi intéressant de par votre, votre métier. Vous recevez énormément de documents. Donc l'intelligence artificielle liée à l'automatisation de la capture et la récupération d'informations pour la classification de vos documents peut aussi vous intéresser dans, dans votre domaine. Donc voilà, sachez qu'au niveau de l'automatisation, nous travaillons principalement avec une plateforme qui est la plateforme DBA, d'IBM, qui permet de faire des tâches de, de la mise en place de robots, d'automatisation, de capture d'informations. Et ben cela pourrait également vous intéresser dans votre travail de tous les jours. Donc, euh, voilà. Merci. Uh, Ian, you've been waiting for a long time. I'm sorry, but thank you for your patience. You have the floor now. Thank you very much. And um, one of the difficulties I have is that I often try to find a way to disagree with fellow panelists because I think it's very interesting. Um, but I've agreed with a lot of what's been said so far. So let me try and um, say something controversial to liven up the room um, a bit. Um, uh, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence and I'm going to sit here now and tell you it's a completely meaningless expression. Yep. Uh, it has no real meaning, for certainly for the context that we are talking about. What we actually talk about are a series of sophisticated computer programs which do very sophisticated things. And that's something completely different, in my view, to artificial intelligence. Um, the best uh, kind of um, test of artificial intelligence I've come across is the one from Professor Turing. Um, who basically said that artificial intelligence is the ability to convince a human that you are interacting with another human. And uh, so that, that seems to me to be a sensible philosophical definition of artificial intelligence. But what we are talking about here um, are the um, tools or applications in, uh, in tech speak um, which enable certain tasks to be done better, more quickly, more accurately, um, whatever the case may be. So when we talk about, uh, certainly when we talk about artificial intelligence, what we mean are complicated computer tools which enable specific jobs to be done. And sometimes that specific job might be, in the case of a chatbot, convincing you that you are talking to a human being when in fact you are talking to um, a, a computer. And that happens um, very often, certainly in customer call centers, um, for example. But it's not really what we are talking about in our context, because people imagine when we say artificial intelligence that we'll wake up one morning uh, and find a robot lawyer sitting at your desk uh, in your place. Um, I actually don't believe that will happen um, either. I think a lot of the developments are happening quickly, but by increments. And they are just sh shaping um, the way that lawyers do their jobs in different ways. And this is not new. This has happened since industrial revolutions um, have happened, where technology has uh, very often uh, not replaced a task. It has changed the way the task um, needs to be done. Um, The other point I want to make is um, what I call adapt and evolve. If the intention of the legal industry is to resist technological change, I have to say that's a battle the industry will lose. Um, technological change is coming, and it will come at different paces in different places. Um, but it is coming, and it will change what the legal profession does the way the legal profession does it. And the other thing I would say, I just wanted to comment on the first panel um, earlier on today when they spoke about uh, why there are so few um, kind of uh, AI startups um, in uh, this region as opposed to some other regions of the world. I don't think it's um, uh, um, a coincidence that the approach to data and personal data is profoundly different. Uh, if I can use the expression, although I've disparaged it, artificial intelligence relies upon data. It's completely useless 
um, without data. And so the more you restrict data, the more you restrict the innovation uh, that comes with um, artificial um, intelligence or complicated uh, data analytics, uh, really, is what I'm talking about um, at the moment. So, um, given that uh, in the European Union, for example, consent is required for the use of personal data for specific purposes, that would require a technology company to somehow predict how technology is going to evolve in the future to have the flexibility to use the data. And that clearly is not, not possible. And then finally, uh, I think I'm probably running out of time, um, uh, is um, an interesting concept um, is how uh, the uh, application of legal analytics will change the way that jobs are done. Let me uh, give you an example. Uh, in the US, um, we have a technology that's able to look at a particular judge, look at the way that judge has decided particular cases, even to determine which kind of arguments are more persuasive in front of that judge, and give you a statistical analysis of your probability of succeeding if you use certain types of arguments in certain types of cases. There are two interesting points there, which are one, the, as has been rightly said earlier on, the decision to use those points rests with the lawyer and not with the uh, artificial intelligence. But secondly, and an in another interesting philosophical conundrum is, when the judge sees their own data, how will that affect the way that they make further decisions? Um, these kind of um, things are going to have to be addressed uh, somehow because the technology already exists to do many of the things that we are talking about. Um, if I say to you, uh, for example, in, in your own law firms, um, the extent to which you use data uh, to make uh, predictions about your own business, about the future cost of a case, about how much uh, a customer uh, client will be charged, um, I ask this at various conferences and very, very few hands go up. Um, there's still very much a case of, well, I'm going to use my professional expertise to make a judgment uh, on this. I also suggest to you that in years to come, the expression professional expertise will be a synonym for a decision taken without sufficient data. <laughs> yep. And uh, so um, these are the changes that are coming along. Um, they are to a large extent inevitable. The amount of resistance in each place will be different, of course, but eventually uh, they will result in a fundamental change in the way that lawyers do their business. And here's the important thing, what it means, the, ne the necessity is for lawyers to move up the value chain. This is the important thing. There won't be really very much more opportunity to make much money out of simple uh, reproduction of processes that can be very easily automated. And so these are the kind of changes I, I think are important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe a very quick question. Uh, it's uh, fascinating, this uh, complicated program, progressing and uh, uh, mining and dating and how you call it. And you come down to the subject of predictability. Uh, predictivity, so in other words, you feed all the uh, the case law into a machine and uh, you know and you draw profiles huh? you draw profiles and then you look at this and you say okay this case voila okay that, that, that I get and I think that's uh, there's one case law in Luxembourg where a doctor did not use enough uh, a journalist doctor did not use enough expert uh, advice uh, to cure a client uh, he was well now with this uh, with this profiling uh, have you seen what's happening in France? Huh? Uh, if you read today's, today's Figaro, uh, you see that uh, the Ministry of Finance is doing data mining to draw lists of suspect people uh, who fraud, etc. Now, uh, you say, well, this has nothing to do with, with law. No, this has to do with law because this, this is, <coughs> becomes criminal law. It becomes tax law, uh, tax evasion. And the same is true for, uh, could be used, let's say, if we were in a uh, not so democratic uh, state or if the minds were changing. Uh, I could imagine that uh, p the police or the Ministry of Justice, they could simply, again, use data and uh, set up uh, lists of uh, dangerous people 
uh, potential criminals. And we know that once you are <coughs> on the list, uh, the next step, uh, whether you are guilty or not guilty, uh, is quickly trépassé. Uh, uh, voilà. So that's a little bit uh, the, uh, the danger that I see there. Uh, uh, maybe. I just want to point out with, with just quickly with respect to what you, you mentioned. First of all, there is the question of um, that uh, Ian pointed out, which is once you know the data about yourself or the, your tendencies, then this actually modifies your behavior itself. And that's a big, uh, it's, it's a feedback loop, which is well known in all of this uh, stuff. But I think that there's an interesting, in France, for example, since you mentioned France, uh, recent law, uh, with respect to what you were saying <coughs> about judges, recent law, from a few months ago, has forbidden anybody from actually analyzing judge decisions. Like, you can analyze the decisions, but you cannot actually analyze how a judge is, uh, is uh, ruling. And if indeed, in the same time, you have the powers, like the finance ministry and so on, who mine their databases to go after the citizens, then I think this creates a kind of an imbalance, a democratic imbalance between the people who detain power and the citizens. The citizens don't, cannot, you know, hold the people who judge them accountable, but the administration can go and use those techniques to go and find them guilty of stuff. And I think that's a real danger, I agree. Thank you. Peut-être un mot pour conclure. Je trouve que vos propos sont rassurants. Nous sommes plus proches de la raison que de la passion. Si je résume ce que j'ai entendu, les legal tech n'ont pas pris de part de marché aux avocats, ils les ont plutôt excités, avez-vous dit. Les Legal Tech offrent aux avocats des opportunités de marché plus qu'une menace. L'intelligence artificielle libère des créneaux de l'avocat et lui rend du temps, notamment pour l'élaboration de sa, sa stratégie, pour travailler plus vite, et cela dans l'intérêt de ses clients. J'ai entendu que les enquêtes montraient que les clients étaient mûrs. L'intelligence artificielle n'est pas faite pour remplacer l'avocat, mais pour l'aider à avoir une meilleure plus-value. L'avocat robot n'est pas pour demain, avez-vous dit. Je m'en réjouis parce que l'avocat est quand même le garant de l'état de droit. L'avocat est le garant de la démocratie. L'avocat humain plutôt qu'un avocat robot, c'est ce que je retiens de vos réflexions. Merci beaucoup. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this uh, a third session on law and innovation. And as you uh, are well aware of, our topic will be about space law today. Uh, that's a, indeed a, a very innovative field of law. And uh, we, we will be exploring that field with you together during the course of this uh, panel discussions. Uh, outer space has indeed, uh, has of course intrigued human mankind for thousands of years. Uh, but uh, active space exploration and the use of uh, the space as such, of outer space, uh, is much more recent uh, because uh, we know that outer space uh, activities really have started roughly uh, six decades ago. And we will show you during our uh, panel some uh, uh, pictures of outer space activities just uh, to uh, give you some idea of, of uh, what outer space is about. Um, so for, for years, uh, outer space activities have been mostly conducted by uh, states, and I would say by the large states, uh, uh, specifically the US and uh, the former Soviet Union, competing to reach the moon. Um, and it is at that time uh, that the first uh, legal framework has been shaped for space activities. Uh, the United Nations has adopted a treaty on outer space activities. Uh, the treaty was agreed upon in 1962, so when the first uh, space activities really started, uh, and entered into force uh, uh, five years later in 1965. Uh, 67, sorry. Uh, this uh, Outer Space Treaty is still the key uh, element of uh, international space law today. Uh, it is built around a series of principles which we will have the uh, uh, opportunity to discuss uh, today. The first principle is the freedom of exploration and use of space for the benefit and interest of all countries. 
The second uh, principle is the principle of non-appropriation of outer space, whatever that means. We will get back to that in a moment. Uh, and uh, the third uh, principle is the prohibition of the deployment of nuclear weapons or other kinds of weapons of mass destruction in outer space. This uh, fundamental treaty on outer space activity uh, by the UN has been reinforced by a set of additional treaties, uh, four, uh, uh, in, um, four main treaties, the Rescue Agreement of 1968 uh, requiring states to assist an astronaut in case of accident, distress, emergency or unintended landing. Uh, the Liability Convention of 1972, which establishes the standard of liability for damage caused by space objects, which is also a topic we will have the occasion to uh, refer to later on. The Registration Convention of 19, six, uh, 1975, sorry, which requires states to register space objects. And the Moon Agreement of 1979, which elaborates on the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, more specific to, to the Moon and other celestial bodies. Uh, in addition to those treaties, there are a series of principles that support this body of law. Uh, there are um, five main sets of principles. The Declaration of Legal Principles Governing the Activities of States in Outer Space of 1963. The Principles Relating to International Direct Television Broadcasting uh, of 1982. The Principles Relating to Remote Sensing of the Earth of 1986 and the principle uh, on the use of nuclear power sources, 1992, and then finally the declaration of, on international cooperation in the exploration and use of outdoor space of 1969. Uh, so uh, this being said, you see uh, already that most of the international framework of space activities um, is, is not that recent. Uh, it dates back to the 1960s and has been further developed over, over the years. Uh, but the most recent treaties uh, uh, are already uh, several decades old. Uh, of course, uh, that field of law is a, a very active field of law. And so a series of intergovernmental organizations are tasked uh, with reviewing the uh, international setting in which space activities are being conducted and specifically also the, the legal problems arising from the exploration of outer space. Among those uh, intergovernmental organizations is the European Space Agency and we have the pleasure today to have a representative of, of the ESA with us. Uh, the United Nations Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space uh, uh, also. And then, uh, in addition, and we should certainly not forget about that, uh, is the international uh, setting and framework uh, for the use of uh, radio spectrum. Uh, there is no space activity without use of uh, satellites and uh, radio spectrum. So the entire framework which has been designed under the International Telecommunications Union, which dates back already to the 19th century, the uh, ITU has been founded in 1865. So a whole series of um, rules at the international level and the question which we will be trying to address during our panel today is uh, to see whether that framework is still um, up uh, to date. Uh, knowing that space activities have evolved dramatically over the recent years. New technologies and broadband connectivity with high altitude platforms transform the business of satellite communications and raise new challenges in terms of spectrum management. And uh, the expedition to near-Earth near asteroids and the moon have uh, yielded remarkable discoveries, uh, making space mining an activity which uh, could uh, uh, be started uh, much faster than we have thought ever before. In order to explore these different uh, aspects of uh, space law, uh, we have the pleasure to welcome an extraordinary panel, which I would like to briefly introduce now uh, in the alphabetical order, if uh, my panel members agree. 
uh, Giuseppe Barberis, uh, and we have a, a panel which has something specific, which is half Italian and half Luxembourgish, uh, the moderator being excluded uh, so that we have uh, two and two. Uh, so Giuseppe Barberis, he's a member of the uh, SES legal team, where he assists in particular the technology team. Uh, that, that's really the heart of uh, what we will be discussing today. Uh, and he has been previously in the uh, satellite world for many years. Uh, he has been the Deputy General Counsel of Eutelsat, which uh, most of you know. So uh, uh, a, a highly experienced expert in uh, satellite law. Thank you very much for, for joining us for this panel. Uh, then to my right, uh, to my left, sorry, sorry, Marco Ferrazzani from the European Space Agency. He's heading the legal department of the European Space Agency uh, and uh, is participating in that capacity also to uh, the international uh, work which is being done in this respect and is uh, notably a member of the uh, uh, UN COPUOS, uh, which I have mentioned before. Uh, to my right then, George Schmidt. Uh, who uh, used to be a Luxembourg civil servant, uh, uh, always very uh, active and interested in space activities. Uh, that dates back uh, uh, latest to the time when he was the general counsel uh, and director of the Luxembourg Trade and Investment Office in San Francisco for, for a series of years, uh, where uh, some of the uh, capacities of uh, building satellites uh, are. Uh, and he now serves uh, the Luxembourg, on the Luxembourg government's advisory board on space resources and is uh, uh, the Luxembourg government's special envoy for space resources. Uh, so thank you uh, to both of you also for, for joining this panel. And last uh, but not least, uh, Laurent Schumer, uh, a, a partner at Arendt and Medenach, a well-known law firm here in Luxembourg, who uh, works with investors who uh, engage in space activities and uh, brings them the necessary comfort uh, to uh, be active in those, in those uh, activities. And many questions arise around uh, uh, these uh, private investments. Thank you, Laurent, for, for joining us uh, also for this topic. Uh, we have discussed uh, the way we uh, would like to present you this uh, discussion. Uh, so there would not, we will not have now four separate uh, presentations, but rather a, a true discussion around four main topics. The first topics being the um, emerging trends in the use and exploration of space and its resources, so that we know a little bit what we are talking about before getting to the legal aspects. Then in a second uh, moment, we will be uh, discussing the uh, current international framework and its possible shortcomings or areas for which we uh, know already that there may be uh, difficulties in applying them to the most recent space activities. In a third uh, moment, we will then uh, logically follow up on this and discuss the most recent initiatives uh, taken at the international level to update the international framework. Those two topics are interlinked. Maybe in our discussions, we will end up merging them to a certain extent. We will see. And then the last uh, topic will be about national initiatives, uh, both uh, the other side of the Atlantic, but also here in Luxembourg, uh, that tend to stimulate new space activities and encourage private investment in this field. So this will be uh, the uh, agenda for our panel discussions, uh, these uh, four topics. So let me start uh, right away with the first topic, the emerging trends in the use and exploration of space um, activities and uh, the use of its resources. Space industry is, in the, uh, is undergoing an extraordinary evolution uh, over the last years uh, uh, in many aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, the, these activities are not exclusively anymore uh, uh, public initiatives. Uh, they haven't been for quite some time, but uh, private investment is more and more present uh, to engage into uh, new space activities, and particularly in activities uh, of space mining. Uh, so that's something we will be discussing now. Um, 
And I would like to give the floor to start with, if uh, you agree, Marco, to you, uh, to give us some insights about uh, these new uh, space activities uh, as an observer. Uh, ESA is particularly well placed to give us some indication what is happening in the space uh, industry. Thank you very much, Andre, and good morning to all of you. The European Space Agency is the space research and development agency of 22 member states in Europe. And what we see a witness, having been developing space technology, rockets and satellite, is that in the last few years, there's been a real revolution. Uh, before being a legal revolution, is a technical and economic revolution. Because of the new components, which are more and more small, electronics, uh, and the components and satellites become more affordable. The access to space has become cheaper. There are new technologies like 3D printing, reconfiguration of satellites in orbit by uh, memories. And so the whole uh, technology of space is becoming easier to access, cheaper, more affordable. So it opens up a whole new range of possibilities which were not available only 10 years ago. And this is what you mentioned very well, to new entrants, which means new investors. They did not exist. So it's not only governments, it's a range of other new uh, areas. What we call in jargon, new space economy. And new space economy, of course, means new investors, means new entrants, which will mean also new laws to be written or applied. What ESA directly sees a witness is, first of all, uh, many measures that we, we do for European economy and state to promote European industry. So we have in ESA what's called business uh, incubators, measures for the small and medium enterprise, up to 100% of funding, a specific regime of intellectual property rights to allow new uh, startups and ventures to develop their own knowledge. So this is a series of measures that accompany this called new space economy. The new space economy is happening now, so it's not yet fully uh, mature to fruition. We are in a typically development phase. But one thing for sure, uh, we can see that the space environment and also the space law environment in a few years, in 10 years' time, will not look like the way it has been in the last 50 years. You very well mentioned the history of uh, international space law from the UN, which is uh, 50 years ago. Certainly in 50 years, the space law environment will be look very different. Uh, and what we can see is that we have to favor that in Europe for European industry, economies, and new entrants, to favor the entrance of new actors. They did not think about space even some, a few days ago. Uh, many of those come from the experience of uh, a new economy or internet-based experience or applications. So in other words, is how the technology, the digital world, can understand the space as an opportunity. Use space as a, as, a, as a place, I would say, but also as a range of technology that become easily available, down to the citizen, down to each of us in our daily life, in the economic activity, and what we call the business application of space. So applying and developing downstream services, more than technology, more than infrastructure. Because rockets and satellites are built, we know how to build them, Europeans know how to build them, is the way how to use them in daily life, and how to think so. How to use them more and more with application services, and how for the space agencies and space ventures, how to go further. In other words, cheap access to space allow us to go further, away from low Earth orbit, back to the moon, and maybe to Mars one day, allows the picture you're seeing to have uh, new probes, also the possibility to reach out to uh, the moon and other uh, celestial bodies, which means Mars, but also asteroids and comets. The ESA mission to the comet uh, Churi five years ago is a demonstration for the first time ever. We met here, you see the picture of an uh, ESA European probe landing on a comet. How difficult it is and how audacious and uh, technically extremely delicate it is. Go into a flying comet and just put a, a probe in it and be able to measure the composition, the chemical composition of comet. It's for scientific reasons. The results are available to on, but it's a technical uh, endeavor that demonstrate the possibility now to do it. We can do it, Europeans were able to do it, uh, to go on a comet or reach an asteroid and then eventually uh, uh, take benefit of what it is or what they can bring back in terms of benefit to the Earth. And that's what you uh, hinted at. So there's a whole new uh, space world, I would say, which is opening today and which will require 
economic and legal uh, tools to be adapted well beyond the treaty that you mentioned, 67, a treaty on principles. And we'll come back to that. It was a treaty on principles. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and you see already on these pictures these uh, extraordinary new activities that are unfolding. Uh, Luxembourg as a state has been visionary uh, years ago already by allowing the establishment and, and, and uh, being instrumental for the establishment of the uh, SESC, uh, uh, Global Satellite uh, Player, uh, here in Luxembourg. That's a long time ago. Uh, but this uh, visionary um, approach of Luxembourg ha hasn't ceased since then. Because uh, today Luxembourg is uh, instrumental in allowing private companies to uh, engage into space resources um, activities, uh, space mining, if I if I may say so. I, I know that it's uh, it's a convenient word, but it's it's not the one which uh, uh, everybody uh, likes best. Uh, and I would like to ask Georges uh, to give us some ideas on, on how Luxembourg uh, suddenly uh, got into uh, this uh, field of activity. Uh, thank you, André. Maybe first a couple of comments. Uh, it looks like I'm the only non-lawyer uh, on this panel, so I will try to be careful not into getting into you know, legal uh, debate as far as I'm concerned. And I hope uh, uh, you, you, you indulge in that. Uh, the, the second uh, uh, comment I would like to make is that if I think if there is one area at the cross-section of passion and reason, it's probably space. I mean, space has been human, humankind's advancement in space have been created by passion much more so than by reason, if I may call it that way, and I'm making abstraction of you know, a number of things that happened in the late 50s and, and 60s regarding the international political environment. Um, and I think it continues uh, to be driven by uh, humankind's passion. Um, this leads me to you know, your question, uh, André. What are the insights that the Luxembourg government uh, uh, has uh, uh, gained um, in, in, with regard to uh, the, the new space uh, economy. And you rightly uh, pointed out that Luxembourg has been into the space economy for 30 years uh, plus, I guess. Uh, I had the great uh, opportunity when I was a young analyst uh, in the early 80s at the Ministry of the Economy to be, uh, to be associated with that adventure, which it was certainly at the time, and uh, many people thought that the government was uh, a, a bit crazy uh, to, to start this, uh, this endeavor, and well, it, it turned out well. So what is the government's vision uh, today? Um, as yes, it's rightly so celebrated, it is, but it is in an industry mainly, you know, which is changing. The typical broadcasting activity of, uh, of, 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 of companies like SES and, and others is basically at the zenith, if not already at the downturn of, of, of that kind of business. And there is new business to be gained, and you know, most of those companies are endeavoring to, to, to define uh, new activities, new businesses, uh, new, new business models uh, for, for their uh, satellites. Now, uh, looking at that, if you look at the space economy today, it is a space economy on Earth, right? Uh, it is for applications on Earth. We are building rockets, companies are building rockets, either for public uh, uh, customers or for private customers like, like SES. Satellites are being built either for scientific purposes or for commercial purposes on Earth. Other applications and services are being developed on Earth to use those satellites for Earth applications, environmental applications or uh, observation applications more. You know, we navigate through our cities you know, with the help of space technologies uh, today and we take it really for granted. And that, I mean, that, that is going to continue. It's going to develop. The 
what we would call uh, the, the, the classical space economy will continue to develop, but also the new space economy in one word. But then there is also a new space economy in the process of developing, in two words. And that is what we would like to call the in-space economy. We're seeing if, if, if humankind wants to progress in exploration uh, of our universe, of our solar system, if humankind wants to, and that is the passionate part uh, of, of humankind's activity, wants to perhaps settle in space, if humankind wants to put a space or a moon village or wants to move on to Mars, I think it is fair to say that we will not be able to do this without creating an in-space economy. In other words, in producing goods and services in space for applications in space. Uh, I make myself a little clearer. If you want to go to Mars, we will not be able to bring all, take all the energy necessary to go to Mars and come back. That is current state of thinking, I believe, and I think Mr. Musk uh, typically refers to, to this. Uh, so the, the, the new vision is a new space economy based on resources that we find in space, that are tr exploited, explored first in space, exploited in space, used in space for humankind's activities in space. I think that is the key message and the key vision of the Luxembourg government, and this is a, of course, very long-term vision, is to participate in that new space economy based on the exploration, the exploitation, and the use of resources in space for, for the use in space as well. Not to bring them back, but for in space use. Thank you very much. This seems indeed uh, a, a quite uh, incredible move of, of mankind to be able to to, to develop activities and services in space uh, and uh, eventually to have villages in space and, and to use outer space in a, in a very new way. Uh, but uh, of course, one, one has to be forward looking and uh, this is something which will happen. The question is rather, uh, it's, it's not if it will happen, but when it will happen. And so uh, it's certainly interesting to see that countries like Luxembourg are engaging in, that, in those sorts and activities right from the start. Uh, now, uh, it has been addressed already, and uh, I think we should get back to that uh, at least briefly, uh, that um, the satellite uh, business is also transforming. Uh, Giuseppe, uh, si ça ne vous dérange pas, je voudrais vous demander de nous donner quelques indications sur la manière dont ce... Uh, cette activité satellitaire elle-même est en train de se transformer. Merci André. Oui, beaucoup a déjà été dit par Marco et Georges quelque part. Leurs deux interventions pourraient déjà refléter une petite synthèse de ce que moi-même je vais dire parce que déjà des points importants ont été soulevés. Euh, donc, de, nous, SES, je ne sais pas dans quelle mesure SES est connu dans l'auditoire, mais enfin, nous, ce qu'on fait, on opère un système de satellite géostationnaire, de géostationnaire et un système de satellite à moyenne orbite, à 8000 km. Quand je pense à Passion à raison, je pense que, pour citer André qui disait, c'était il y a très longtemps, c'était finalement il y, a, il y a que 30 ans, en réalité, que SES et des poussières, comme rajoutait Georges, que SES existe. Et à l'époque, je crois qu'il y avait surtout beaucoup de passion et beaucoup moins de raison. Parce qu'effectivement, ce n'était pas du tout garanti que l'initiative luxembourgeoise puisse avoir du succès. Bien au contraire, elle a été bien chahutée, elle a été bien contestée, elle a bien été contrariée par pratiquement tous les autres pays européens. Notamment à l'époque, surtout ceux de l'Union européenne, il y avait, n'oublions pas, et ça c'est un point qui reviendra après, je pense, dans les discussions, qu'à l'époque où tous les traités ont été rédigé, adopté, on vivait dans un monde avec deux blocs, donc où l'aspect politique n'était pas était bien plus important que l'aspect économique qu'il y a aujourd'hui. Ceci étant, donc euh, SES s'est développé, donc nous avons et nous avons toujours été à l'avant-garde la, en termes d'initiatives, d'innovation technologique. Nous avons été les premiers à colocaliser des satellites. 
ça semble une banalité aujourd'hui, ça ne l'était pas à l'époque. Nous avons été les premiers à lancer avec des lanceurs russes, euh, ex-soviétiques. On a été les premiers à lancer avec des satellites réutilisables. Cela pour dire que nous avons toujours été à l'avant-garde en matière de technologie. Mais n'empêche que aujourd'hui, et Georges y faisait allusion tout à l'heure, aujourd'hui nous, nous, nous devons relever un nouveau défaut technologique et j'attribuerai la responsabilité de cette situation dans laquelle nous nous trouvons, j'aurais envie de dire, je l'attribuerai à mon fils essentiellement. Quand, quand euh, nous avons acheté une nouvelle télévision à la maison, moi je me suis retourné vers mon fils et je lui ai demandé, mais tu es content de la nouvelle télévision Il avait 12 ans à l'époque et il m'a dit, oui, oui, je suis super content, elle est magnifique. Mais j'aurais bien préféré que tu m'achètes un téléphone mobile. Parce que ce que lui veut aujourd'hui, c'est être connecté tout le temps, être connecté, pouvoir se promener et avoir toujours de la connexion. Ce n'est plus du tout la manière que nous, on avait, le modèle sur lequel SES s'était fondé, c'est-à-dire je mets tout le monde devant un canapé et nous regarder à la télévision en zappant sur 8000 canaux. Oui, parce que nous, on fournit 8000 canaux, si vous voulez. Vous pouvez zapper pendant 8000 fois. Euh, c'est plus ça qu'ils cherchent. Aujourd'hui, ce qu'ils veulent, c'est de la mobilité, de la connectivité partout, dans n'importe quel endroit. Ils veulent être connectés. Aujourd'hui, je me suis retrouvé à discuter avec des, des opérateurs aéromobiles, avec des constructeurs d'avions qui fournissent des trajets de deux heures. Je sais pas, deux heures, c'est vraiment un trajet relativement court. Eh bien... Ces constructeurs d'avions, ces opérateurs veulent pouvoir fournir de la connectivité dans les avions. C'est-à-dire, même deux heures, ce n'est pas suffisant. Vous vous rendez dans l'avion, vous lisez votre journal, vous, vous buvez un café, vous êtes déjà arrivé. Non, il faut fournir de la connectivité. Donc, c'est ce, ce nouveau défi qu'aujourd'hui, SES est en train de vivre. On n'a pas peur de ça, on est déjà en train de le mettre en place. Merci, André, pour la photo sur le, le, notre système au, au 3B, qui, va, qui est un système de robot de base, qui va fournir de la connectivité partout dans le monde, à n'importe quel endroit, à n'importe qui, et qui va être... Euh, renforcé dans, dans, dans deux ans par un système encore plus performant. Aujourd'hui, le défi, c'est ça pour nous. Essayer d'amener la connectivité partout, essayer de, de pouvoir que tout le monde soit connecté. C'est notre, notre mission, c'est le défi vu de manière, comment dirais-je, sans, sans que ce soit un rêve, parce que c'est quelque chose qui est faisable, difficile, mais faisable. On va en discuter quand on va parler des lois existantes. Mais c'est objectif faisable et c'est une étape fondamentale aussi pour pouvoir après aboutir à cette vision plus ample que celle que Georges venait d'évoquer au niveau de l'objectif la, de la, de luxembourgeois sur les, le développement de, de l'espace. Merci pour ces précisions. Euh, on voit donc euh, sur cet arrière-fond euh, le cadre réglementaire, législatif ou international que l'on vient de d'indiquer brièvement euh, se trouve euh, certainement dans un certain décalage par rapport aux nouvelles activités. And that's what we uh, will be exploring now. And I, I suggest to my panel members that we, we merge in a certain way uh, question two and three together because I see in terms of timing that would uh, possibly be a better idea if you, if you agree with me uh, on, on this. Uh, you, you, you only have... Uh, half of a choice, uh, but uh, I, I still want to be, this to be as consensual as possible. So uh, let me start with a, a few words of, of introduction here, again very briefly. As was, uh, as was already mentioned by uh, Marco just uh, before, the Outer Space Treaty of uh, 1967 uh, is a principle-based treaty. It has roughly 13 principles which uh, relate to space activities and then the ordinary additional principles of, of, of an inter international treaty. And I would like to give you, to read out to you only two brief uh, parts of that treaty, of Article 1 and Article 2. Uh, and Article 1, I'll just take the first sentence. The exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and the interest of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic and scientific de development, and shall be the province of all mankind. That sounds uh, really nice. Um, Uh, and then Article 2, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use of, or occupation, or by any other means. 
Uh, one sees uh, from these two uh, provisions, and there are many others uh, which I, I could uh, refer to, the spirit, uh, the overall philosophy in which these treaties have been shaped in the 1960s. And the question, of course, today is with these new activities developing, if uh, this is still in line with what we expect from the international uh, framework, uh, because activities have changed. Uh, actors have changed. We have uh, smaller actors. We have private investors who want a certain level of legal certainty, who don't want to engage into space activities without being certain that they may have a certain return on their investment, even if it is a quite speculative uh, endeavor to start with. So uh, at the international level, there have been progresses that have been made to address those concerns. And just to give you uh, uh, two indications in this respect, which are recent. In uh, June this year, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space has adopted guidelines for the long-term uh, sustainability of outer space activities. Uh, so that's something we will be addressing now too. Or the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group has, uh, is currently drafting uh, building blocks for the development of an international framework on space resources activities. Uh, that, those building blocks have been agreed upon in 2017, but are uh, still, this is still work under construction, as, as we will hear also now. So, uh, a, a overall, a, a legal framework which uh, needs to be revisited, resought, and I would like to uh, give the floor now to Laurent uh, uh, to give us uh, a little bit the perspective of the private investor who is engaging in space activities, uh, who is seeking for a certain level of legal uh, assurance and, and certainty. What are they really expecting, Laurent? And what are the shortcomings or uncertainties which uh, are hampering their activities today? Well, if I wanted to be very short, I would say we need a legal framework, kind of, for these new activities. Because, as you said correctly, the treaties are principle-based. And so you have not in these treaties yet, because they're principle-based, all the detail you need. But you also have a different philosophy with these treaties if you look at it from a private enterprise perspective. Because these treaties were not necessarily written with a view to allow private actors to be active in, in space. Um, an example, which is a fundamental question, for instance, is you talked about space mining. If uh, people do not like this term, I will nonetheless use it. But it's the capacity of somebody uh, who has a private company to develop a technology, to develop the means and tools to go on uh, a celestial body, an asteroid, and extract water from it for propulsion or to extract some uh, metals from it, or whatever. There's a fundamental question that still is there under international law is, um, as André has been mentioning, no state can appropriate a celestial body. That means you cannot because the Americans did plant a U.S. flag on the moon. It's now not the 51st state of the United States of America. Okay, so no state can say this is my territory. At the same time, does that then mean that if you are a private enterprise and you go on the moon and you extract water from the moon, that the private company that has extracted that water from the moon, who, who, who is the owner of that water? Is that the private company, like would be normal on Earth, to say you have extracted this resource, it's your resource, you can explore it, you can get the benefit of it? Or are the principles that André has been mentioning such that effectively this all belongs to everybody in the world? Because there are some treaties which you have not mentioned, the Moon Treaty, that says that these celestial bodies are the common heritage of humankind, meaning it belongs to all of us. So there cannot be kind of a private enterprise uh, and there cannot be a private appropriation, or if there is a private appropriation, it will be taxed very highly because everything belongs to all of us and not to individual private companies. So you see there's a fundamental questions like this that now are getting triggered. Uh, and uh, the treaties can be interpreted, as you know, we, we, we are a lot of lawyers indeed, George, and we will not get into the debate and disputes of lawyers usually, but as you know, where there are lawyers in the room, you get at least two lawyers, three readings of the same thing, something like that. So you see, there is a little bit of uncertainty here, and we need to get the fundamentals right. Is private enterprise in space activities possible, and what are the limits thereof? That's a principal discussion that needs still to be had. Then there comes the detail. If you look at uh, space activities 
there is a regulation, there is coordination, you cannot put up a satellite in space as you wish, there is a uh, regime that uh, 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 goes with it, there is national legislation who says what an operator like SES needs to comply with, there are there's international coordination about it. These rules do not exist for other in-space activities yet, so we need to come up with these rules as well. Uh, space is big, but uh, if you go into the details of it, there can be a lot of interference between actors in space, and the more actors, the more private activity you have in space, the more important it becomes to make sure that they do this activity in a coordinated way between themselves, that there's no interference, that if there's interference between these actors, between what they do, well, there are rules as to how to settle these interferences, that there are a lot of liability questions if you go uh, and mine on an asteroid or on a celestial body uh, that can have harmful consequences. Who is responsible for that? The state is responsible for that. Uh, the state that has been, uh, let's say, roughly speaking, is responsible for the private company uh, that goes into space, but under what regime will the private company be responsible within that state under what legislation. So we have to work out all these topics of liability, of coordination and so on under a legal framework which will be a mix of adapting international uh, legislation and treaties which takes always time, this is not an easy exercise to do, together with national legislation. And so investors and actors in the private sector expecting this legal framework to move on as fast as possible. Thank you, Laurent, and you are, you are already giving some hints on what we will be addressing later on, which is, which is nice. Uh, I would like uh, uh, to, to take a little bit a, stay, uh, a step back in time, uh, because it's, of course, not the first time that uh, the international community is confronted with the exploration of, of resources which are supposed to be uh, uh, resources belonging to human mankind as such. Uh, and I would like to take the example of the exploration of the deeper sea resources and uh, ask Marco if he wants to uh, give us some insights on this and uh, in what respect this could be a, a useful uh, in source of in inspiration for what we are addressing today in space. Yes, and thank you. And we have looked at that and um, it's very interesting to look at the example. It has already been working for years, created in the, in the UN system. The UN Convention of Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, has created a specific regime for international uh, high seas and seabed. So which means the profound seabed, which belongs to no, no national jurisdiction be beyond the 200 miles of the economic zone, uh, where still there may be minerals which may be useful. And uh, that, what, uh, that system, the convention among all countries, created what's called the International Seabed Authority that exists and works. And on request of private mining uh, enterprise, it, it allows license and authorization to go and exploit the seabed. This works. There are a few licenses, not very many because even technically it's very difficult to go there. So in a way, compared to space endeavor, uh, the licenses are being given with a certain of conditions, the duty, even environmental standards, how to protect the environment or to restore the situation, which is typically of mining law, even on the earth, uh, to restore and, uh, and minimize the impact of the mining activity. So all this is being done. So there is an example there. Maybe it's a yet, uh, not yet mature ex example because it's not been working enough, there's not enough experience, but at least there is a model, not exactly to be taken like that, but there is a comparison to be made. Uh, another comparison I would make, and this is even more pertinent, is a space uh, example. You mentioned it earlier. Since the creation of space uh, missions and telecommunication, like Giuseppe has indicated, space frequencies are a scarce international resource that are uh, distributed and authorized by a world system, which is the International Telecommunication Union, ITU. So this is already a space resource, limited, already given and distributed by allocation of frequency to states, and then states in turn give it by national law allocation to their own operators. So there is a system. We can discuss them, they may be not be perfect, and by, by definition, these are limited resources, so there is a limit to that. And exactly because they're limited, 
that they belong as a province of mankind. This is the principle, the ethical principle behind. If they were unlimited, probably we would not have this kind of situation. So as soon as you think about something which is difficult to reach, as a component of human passion, so everybody has a sense of belonging to go there, and, and they are limited, of course comes into play the need of a legal framework with all conditions that uh, Laurent has so much well defined. So our work is exactly, and this year is a very exciting time for this generation of lawyers to look into this kind of questions and be able to shape the future. But I would say before shaping the future on legal principle and concept like ownership, possession, property, rights, exclusivity, we have to see what is the more general um, political interest and the policy of states. And these are being mature right now. So we don't have yet a general consensus worldwide about the resources, the regime. There are bold uh, initiative and government policy, like you heard the government of Luxembourg, which is very interesting, the US government, maybe soon the Arab Emirates uh, creating a space law exactly on that. There are some governments who are avant-garde in indicating these interests and policies. And the law will follow, I would say. Facts first and law second. That sounds uh, like a very uh, reasonable and practical yeah. approach. And indeed, I think uh, these uh, uh, precedents uh, are uh, in the mind of all those who are currently working on uh, reshaping space law to account for the new activities. And uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to Georges again to give us some insight on, on what is the uh, state of discussion today in certain of those forums. <sighs> Yeah, well, that's a, that's that's a long a lo could could be a long story. Uh, of course, I, I try to to stay short. Indeed, um, the 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 U.S. initiative of of 2015 and uh, Luxembourg initiative of uh, uh, 2017 to create a, a legal basis um, for basically executing uh, Article Four, I think, of the of the OST Treaty of 1967, but also make a statement about the capacity of space resources to be owned, which is, I think, a key issue in, in the whole uh, debate, has, has triggered international debate, which is, I wouldn't say was, was, was the aim of, of the whole exercise, but it is certainly a necessary debate that uh, uh, needs, to be, needs to be done uh, as current international law um, as was uh, stated uh, previously, is based on, on principles and does not give enough direction, both you know, the, 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 the written law but also the, 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 the soft law that has been you know, enacted through declarations, guidelines, and, and what have you, does not give answers to investors, entrepreneurs that are interested in space exploration in the use of space resources. So uh, this this discussion uh, needs to be need, needs to be held still. I mean, uh, the clarification of uh, international law uh, regarding uh, the the exploitation and uh, and use of uh, of space resources still needs to be uh, needs to be held. Uh, I think the good news is that the process has been engaged. I mean, since two uh, years, there is discussion now at the United Nations COPIOS level, the COPIOS, the Committee on the Peaceful Use uh, of Outer Space, which is a, 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 a group, a committee of, I think, 90 plus uh, member states that meet uh, annually uh, uh, to, to, to debate you know, current topics of, of international uh, of, of, of space and co space corporation, space law. There is there is two subgroups. There is the legal subcommittee, which deals essentially with legal issues. There is the scientific and technical uh, subcommittee, which deals more with, with, of course, as, as the name says, scientific and technical issues. So, so the debate is engaged, and there has been an attempt, um, uh, I believe, last year to uh, well last June. I believe to set up a, a working group uh, that should particularly deal uh, with uh, issues of, of, of giving more substance and more more direction uh, to uh, uh, international uh, international space law and particularly in its aspect of, of, of space resources. This. Um, 
working group uh, is not set up yet. I mean, uh, you can imagine that there is, you know, with, with 90 countries, there is uh, more than 90 opinions probably. Uh, and currently, uh, the, the, there is two mediators who are basically in an intersessional mode uh, talking to, to, to key members of, uh, or typically all members of this um, uh, committee to find a common ground in order to define a mandate uh, for, this, uh, for this working group. And I assume in, in the spring of next year uh, with the legal subcommittee meeting and uh, later on in June with the um, uh, full committee meeting, uh, hopefully we can make, uh, make, make some advances on this topic of creating the subcommittee. But defining a mandate for a group of essentially legal experts, of course, also means uh, that there needs to be policy guidance. And I think that's the hard part of this whole uh, process. Uh, what are the legal experts supposed to end up with? Uh, what are the bases on which they, they work? Is there a common agreement among states that space resources should be able to be exploited, used, traded, owned? before we ask the lawyers to you know, set up a, a system of how these rights might be allocated between public, by the way, or private users. I mean, it is not necessarily, you know, space law does not only apply to private users, to commercial users, it also applies to, to public users who may operate as commercial uh, entities. Uh, so, so these are, this is kind of the current, the current debate. Um, uh, what is the policy goal? What what is the mandate? Should the mandate? Uh, you know, there might be two two steps uh, in in this mandate. What is what? How should the law, international law, be clarified? And what system of allocation of rights should there be devised? And here the uh, deep sea uh, uh, authority might be a, a good example uh, to 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 lead such a discussion. We can learn, I think, from a very long debate that took place back in the 80s and, and 90s, I think, to set up uh, this law. Some people think that uh, this, this, this mechanism, I should say, um, uh, has, has drawbacks. And well, let's, let's learn from it, and let's perhaps uh, find, find a better system. So that's, again, that's, that's the current state uh, of, of debate. It will take time to set up the group. And I think it will take even more time to set up the legal and regulatory framework for space exploration in the future. Merci pour ces précisions. Et euh, euh, donc, on, on voit que c'est une aventure euh, encore de longue haleine, euh, également pour les juristes, pour euh, savoir dans, dans quelle direction euh, on va redéfinir les règles du jeu. Euh, et pour ajouter un, un, une couche de, 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 de complexité ou de difficulté, euh, je voudrais euh, demander maintenant à, à Giuseppe de nous, de nous expliquer euh, en quoi euh, ce n'est pas que le droit de l'espace à proprement parler qui est en jeu, mais également son interaction avec les législations, euh, je dirais, euh, terriennes. Euh, je ne sais pas si c'est une expression euh, euh, utile, mais disons, euh, Giuseppe comprend de quoi je, je veux parler. Merci André. Et une fois de plus, je, me rappuie en, rappuie, je vais m'appuyer encore sur ce que Marc, Laurent et Georges ont dit. Effectivement, je me retrouve quasiment, alors que je pensais travailler dans un secteur de pointe, à faire la figure d'être des, des « old-fashioned guy ». Avec tout ce qu'on parle d'exploration, d'extraction d'eau sur la Lune, etc., je me retrouve à être le vieux là-dedans. Je ne suis pas habitué à ce rôle. Ceci dit, c'est vrai, vrai que nous, on se confronte d'aujourd'hui avec une situation concrète qui est celle de comment est-ce que je peux fournir davantage mes services. Quand Georges fait allusion, fait allusion, enfin pas fait allusion, il a carrément dit je travaille dans un groupe de travail qui a 90 membres, et moi je vois 90 membres, donc je vois 90 états. Si je vois 90 états, je vois 90 opinions différentes. Je vois presque, j'ai envie de... Enfin, je parle entre amis, donc le pire des 100, je dirais, 90 industries spatiales différentes. Et 90, 90 industries spatiales différentes, ça veut dire que chacune va protéger son propre intérêt. Elle a raison. 
la raison, raison de, il, y a, il y a une raison de faire ça. Mais tout ça, ça se reflète de quelle manière Ça se reflète de la manière que moi, aujourd'hui, en tant qu'opérateur super global, avec toute ma connectivité, parce que j'ai appris la leçon de mon fils, et donc je, je fournis d'Internet partout, je me retrouve à devoir obtenir des licences dans plein de pays qui vont peut-être me mettre des obstacles et qui ont peut-être une, une petite crainte, une petite crainte que moi, je vienne mettre, j'essaie je, d'envahir, alors que je veux que ce soit fournir des services. Ils ont un intérêt à protéger, à développer leur industrie spatiale. Donc, aujourd'hui, quand je pense à je pense aux années 60, André faisait référence tout à l'heure, quand le système s'est mis en place, il n'y avait pas d'industrie spatiale. Il y, avait, il y avait des pionniers, il y avait des pionniers qui essayaient, oui, avec, avec quelques, quelques, on avait construit quelques fusées, on, on avait lancé un Spoutnik, je veux dire, mais, mais on n'avait pas vraiment une industrie spatiale. L'industrie spatiale s'est développée après. Et aujourd'hui, quel est le pays qui n'a pas d'industrie spatiale Tout le monde a une industrie spatiale et tout le monde va vouloir la protéger à juste titre. Mais cela amène à ce qu'il y ait des... Pour ceux qui sont déjà dans le, dans le domaine, pour ceux qui peuvent déjà fournir des services, pour ceux qui peuvent déjà... Euh, atteindre 99% de la population, ils se, nous, 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 ils se heurtent dans le cas d'espèce et nous, nous nous heurtons à des, à des restrictions sur Terre. Et je veux vraiment voir comment on pourra se mettre tous d'accord à niveau international pour adopter des traités qui puissent permettre de récupérer, de, de permettre à tout le monde cet accès global, cette, 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 je ne parle pas que de mon accès, mais enfin en particulier, oui, mais pas que exclusivement, mais comment on pourra retrouver une, philo, une philosophie, un esprit qui permette vraiment une approche com, commune et ample et globale à l'espace. Je m'arrêterai là. Merci. Euh, N'hésitez pas euh, de, de demander la parole spontanément. Vous n'avez certainement pas besoin de moi pour orchestrer ce, ce, ce table ronde. Donc, euh, je, je le dis aux membres du panel qu'ils ne se gênent pas d'intervenir spontanément. Euh, euh, alors, euh, je voudrais maintenant venir à, à, un, à, un, à un autre aspect, le dernier aspect de notre, de notre discussion qui est celui des initiatives qui ont été prises sur un plan national. Euh, puisque, comme Georges nous l'a expliqué, euh, le débat international qui euh, se déroule à l'heure actuelle a été en partie stimulé par deux initiatives euh, prises d'une euh, part par les États-Unis à travers le, le US Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act de, 1900, de 2015 et ça, qui, qui autorise précisément les, les citoyens américains euh, de s'engager dans des activités d'exploration de l'espace et donc de, de pouvoir s'approprier des ressources de l'espace. Euh, et la loi luxembourgeoise du 20 juillet 2017 sur euh, l'exploration des, des ressources de l'espace. Ces deux, ces deux États ont donc euh, stimulé une nouvelle réflexion sur un plan international et on s'était demandé, en organisant ce panel, dans quel ordre on devrait aborder les, les questions, puisqu'en définitive, on aurait pu parler de ces initiatives nationales avant de revenir à, à la discussion internationale. Mais voilà, nous y sommes. Et je voudrais euh, passer la parole à Marco euh, pour qu'il nous euh, donne quelques indications sur euh, l'utilité euh, ou le caractère approprié de ces initiatives nationales euh, et en particulier, peut-être, euh, à partir de la première initiative, celle de, des États-Unis. Je dirais, uh, I would say um, that, first of all, let's go back to the picture. Um, we said there are international treaties of 60s and so on, but and these are principles. For whatever the principles do not provide, uh, then, then national laws kick in, we have to read national laws. That's the general principle. But there is a fundamental principle of the outer space, Treaty of 67, that clearly says you can go freely to outer space, all nations can go to outer space, uh, even private initiatives can go to space, private actors. However, each launching state will have the duty to authorize and continuously supervise what the private activity is doing. So, This is a big difference from what you see in transport law, maritime law, telecommunication, where private actors have direct responsibility. That's why national laws are necessary for the state to authorize and supervise. 
And that's why, and I will come to you as law in a minute, that's why many nations around the world have written national space laws, including many European countries, in which there's a clear way how to ask for authorization, the authorization is given, the so-called national licensing after technical checks and so on. And in this case, I can tell my office, ESA, we help a lot national legislation to be developed in European countries. That's the thing we do, we advise national governments. In the last 10 years, you see there's a range of at least 10 national laws. France, Belgium, Netherlands, Finland, Denmark, Portugal. Many countries have written national laws exactly to do that. So this is not to limit, but to enable private actors to go to space and to assume the international uh, duty of the treaty. Now, in this VAG, in this uh, whole range of writing laws, national laws are also used exactly with the idea to enable or to attract uh, in private investors to something which is now authorized and enabled. And this is the spirit of the US law uh, of 15 and the Luxembourgish law of 17. Exactly I mean, the idea that not only you can do telecom, earth observation, or uh, other many satellites that you see in the picture of constellations, but you also will be authorized to go and explore resources. That's why national law becomes, uh, it's two things. First of all, a sign of a policy position as very well George has explained, is a strong and visible sign to reassure the investor community that the country will authorize. So come forward with your initiative, we shall authorize you. And second thing is a way to how to implement the international treaty obligations of the so-called authorization and continuous supervision, because in the end, that state will become legally liable in front of all other states in terms of using a common resource, and therefore the common regime, seabed authority, whatever it is. So national law becomes, I would say, the pivot, the fundamental necessary tool to make all this happen. So it's not just a nice to have or a complement of an international uh, ratifying a national treaty, it becomes a, the, uh, the fundamental springboard upon which new activity will flourish. And basically, thanks to that, that you have this policy initiative resource in Luxembourg, in the US, maybe in new countries before. And this book still has to be written. I know, uh, but I cannot, of course, speculate in public, of many other states who are preparing national laws or piece of law exactly with the objective to go into that, and even countries that are agreeing among themselves how to prepare for that. So, as I say, there's a very exciting time for this generation of lawyers, uh, and I would say there's even opportunity for the law firms around the world to start a space practice. Thank you, Marco, for that. Uh, so, uh, being here in Luxembourg, I think it would be appropriate, uh, uh, even if we do that briefly, because we have roughly seven, eight minutes left for our panel, uh, to, to go a little bit deeper into the Luxembourg Initiative, which is, a, in reality, a two-step initiative. Uh, we have already addressed uh, the enactment of the law of July 2017 for space uh, resources, which is, as, you, as Marco has rightly explained, a consequence of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty because uh, governments uh, need to authorize uh, and supervise activities by non-governmental uh, entities uh, that carry out space activities. Uh, so we have this law of 2017, and we have an additional um, initiative which is, which is still uh, being shaped currently, which is a new space act for Luxembourg. And I would like to give the floor back to Georges if you would like to give us some explanations on this. Yes, I guess, I guess very briefly, I think it's, as it was rightly pointed out, and you may say Luxembourg you know, started from, from the back of the horse uh, and, 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 and not from the top. So Luxembourg started first by enacting a, a, a law uh, uh, essentially translating the obligations of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty uh, into, into Luxembourg law, uh, solely focused on activities related to uh, the exploitation and use of space resources. Uh, that was back in 2017, as you rightly pointed out. Today, there is another initiative uh, pending before Parliament, a, a, a draft bill, um, uh, which deals with uh, all the other uh, activities um, um, uh, of, of private companies uh, in, in space that, of course, also need an authorization according and supervision according to Article 6 of, of OST, and which deals with, 
course, many, many other things. Uh, uh, as, I, as I said, this is currently uh, a, under discussion uh, in the Luxembourg Parliament. Uh, I would not uh, dare to say when, when it will be uh, uh, voted on. Uh, that's, as you said, uh, work in progress. Um, maybe I leave it to Giuseppe then to explain how SES uh, was uh, regulated uh, until now under which uh, legal context, because of course there was no void in Luxembourg uh, until until now. So, but I'm not an expert on on that part. Je suis censé vous dire comment OSS a été régulée. Elle a été toujours régulée très bien, je vais dire. Dans le, vu, vu le succès qu'elle a eu, je pense, je pense, je pense que la base égale, et c'est sûrement, c'est surtout des, des relations qui s'étaient créées directement avec le gouvernement et, et, le, et le ministère et les, et les ministères de compétences. Il y avait des échanges, des échanges constantes euh, entre nous et entre SES et le gouvernement. Et c'est comme ça, et c'est comme ça que jusqu'à ce que la, la loi ne soit adoptée, la, le fonctionnement des SES a été, a été assuré. Et ECS a toujours été un peu euh, l'ambassadeur de, de, de l'État luxembourgeois en matière de, de, de droit de l'espace et de, et, de et, de, et de télécommunications en particulier. Uh, yes, perhaps to, to add to this, uh, what I meant to say, I think uh, essentially, uh, I mean, it's not that SES and the Luxembourg government did not follow international law until uh, until now. Uh, the, the authorization procedure and supervision procedure was based on the media law, uh, which has been in existence in Luxembourg for, for many years, media and communications law. So um, this, this was so far uh, the basis for authorization and supervision of, of, of SES activities. We, we chose in this respect, I would say, the very practical uh, approach of the Luxembourg government. Uh, first of all, attracting uh, an, uh, an, a highly uh, uh, specialized company on its ground and then uh, shaping the appropriate legal framework in a, in a very down-to-earth practical way relating to uh, mostly uh, sp uh, spectrum allocation and, and, uh, and things around spectrum allocation. And now going a step forward, by learning uh, through the industry, both SES but also the new actors uh, who uh, are active in uh, or prepare to be active in space exploration, uh, to see how we sh can shape a full uh, space law in addition to the law uh, of 2017. So a very uh, practical uh, and uh, uh, approach and, and uh, business-driven and business-friendly approach. And this uh, leads me to give the floor back to Laurent. Uh, because at the end, uh, uh, governments may be proactive, but it's uh, the investors who will assess uh, if this was really uh, what needed to be done. So uh, uh, from the inside you gain with your contacts uh, with the industry, uh, do you have the impression that uh, these uh, initiatives in Luxembourg are, are welcome? Are they are going far and fast enough? Uh, what is your uh, insight on this? Well, I think that, uh, as Marco has been saying, these initiatives, it's a policy statement. I think Luxembourg was very clear about what its position is going to be. So that's going to be very important for investors because they want to be in a jurisdiction uh, and a state that supports uh, their view of, of, uh, of the business and will defend their rights when it comes to developing that new law. Uh, and uh, enforcing that new law when, when it comes to it. So I think it is very, very positive as um, such. Uh, I think the investors also appreciate that with taking such initiatives, jurisdictions create an ecosystem. I mean, if you would have talked to me 10 years ago, I wouldn't have read the Outer Space Treaty and wouldn't have known anything about it before. Uh, now we are in a Luxembourg law firm where suddenly some people have a space uh, capacity and are interested in the topic. And actually, as I tell my kids, make a little bit of money out of it, actually. So uh, it creates an ecosystem. And that is what Luxembourg is building as well. And that's the result of the law. It's to create the academia, the research, but also the legal framework that comes with it at the university. There are a lot of students who learn this law. So that is something where investors see an ecosystem uh, coming up and developing. So that is very positive for them. But then again, to get us back down to earth, um, 
they are not necessarily primarily concerned at this very moment in time by the legal framework because it will still take some time for somebody on a private basis to explore uh, some asteroids. They're still looking at your business model first. So we still have a little bit of time. And as I, I loved Marco saying fact first, then the law. We're still in this phase where uh, the investors that actually go out of it, after it, go out of it for passion. So you have the governments because it's a policy, you have this well-known milliardaires, billionaires that are around high net worth individuals. We are only in the face of making these investments attractive for normal investors. The legal framework is very important for them, but the first thing they look at is what are the economics behind these long-term ventures uh, as such. But initiatives by Luxembourg create an ecosystem which provides a lot of comfort, and that, that is the positive about it. For that, uh, and, and thank you also for giving me the little hint uh, 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 concerning the university. We have indeed uh, engaged in uh, space law for uh, quite some years now. We have hired a specialized professor in space law, Maulena Hoffmann. She will be the one organizing the uh, work of the uh, Hague International Space Resources uh, Working Group uh, next week. Uh, here in Luxembourg, yes, next week, for, uh, from Monday to, to Wednesday. And we have also a specialized master program in space law for several years now, which is uh, quite something uh, special, I would say. And I see that we have even some of the students of that master program here in, in the room today. So uh, the university is also engaging in that, and I hope that helps uh, shaping the, the, the correct uh, ecosystem. Uh, our time is uh, just about uh, over. I would like to ask uh, the panel members if uh, they would like to add uh, something to our discussion at this point. Yes, please, Marco. Just a point of uh, wish, but also of uh, indication to legislators and future lawyers uh, working on space law. We need collectively to increase the knowledge, and Laurent has explained it well in terms of both university preparation, we do it, uh, I also teach in some universities, I'm invited to give conferences, but especially to train the regulators, the future regulators, because they are today used to give a telecom license or transport license or in countries with maritime or air aviation worthiness. Uh, there's a new sector which will be called the space licensing and space regulator. So we have uh, a task collectively as a generation to uh, have regulators that understand technology, that are able to uh, assess the right level of liability, the country, not the company only, company, the country is taking liabilities internationally, and to make it an easy flow process, not a dramatic one. So it's a matter of if we want space sector and space economy to advance, we have to uh, understand the responsibility to train the regulators, help the legislator in writing national laws, and open possibly space practices. And some, some law firms I admire are more advanced than others in opening up this kind of knowledge because it will become necessary. So maybe it's a message to the legislators and the future law firms in the room that will do some space work there is a whole new um, knowledge to be developed. And that's uh, important for this Congress of Lawyers. Luia has always been at the, at the, uh, the point of uh, showing, I guess, um, uh, the advancement of the legal profession. That's a message for you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Giuseppe, would you like to uh, add something? Well, no, not particularly, just maybe one thing. I mean, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, when Luxembourg started this initiative in, uh, in 1985, it, it was under Luxembourg State, and it was really a, luck, a state having a real entrepreneurial mind when they started the CIS. And a lot of people started, was looking at that in a very, very, I would say, dubious way, reluctant, and they would say, this is not, not going to work. It worked. It worked very well. And, uh, and I can tell you that when I today travel around the world and conferences and congress, or maybe simply to to discuss with suppliers, when the name of Luxembourg, the name of SES is extremely well respected. So, so I would say if I can use a, make reference to a very old film of the 1950s, I mean, with Peter Sellers, the, the mouse that roared, well, the mouse is now turned into a lion, and everybody, everybody is very much, so I, I wish, I wish we really, everybody takes Luxembourg as an example, really big, 
and maybe even in terms of law firm, develop the relationship with the Luxembourgish law firms because, because there's a lot of things to learn in terms of space law here. Laurent, I think you have given already your last words. If you, if you don't, uh, or would you like to? It's a pleasure. Uh, yes, perhaps a uh, last word, and I'm grateful to, to Laurent uh, to have uh, uh, mentioned the key word ecosystem. Uh, I mean, uh, my background is, is a policy background, uh, and working for the government in innovation for, for a very long time, I, I cannot I cannot quit here without saying that the government's policy is an economic development policy. I mean, space today is close to 2% of GDP uh, in Luxembourg. That's, that's probably you know, one of the many records uh, that we hold. And uh, uh, the idea is to continue developing this uh, uh, space activity in Luxembourg by creating uh, what Laurent referred to uh, an ecosystem uh, of space, which perhaps has as a vision the uh, use, the, 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 the peaceful exploration and sustainable use of space resources for the benefit of humankind, and I'm quoting the Luxembourg vision, and, and so built this, 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 this ecosystem of uh, legal, business, finance, technology pillars that will lead us to this, this, this to, to realize this vision of, of uh, space exploration. So I think that's very important. And you referred particularly to, to the university programs. And one of the, the key aspects is, of course, create talent. Um, you referred to the master's program. We need legal talent, of course. We will also need technology, uh, technical uh, talent, business talent. And that's why the university has also launched a, a, an interdisciplinary master's degree in space this, this past September, so a couple of months ago only. So these are all building blocks of this uh, ecosystem. We work together with, with EIB, with, with the VC and the private equity industry in order to create this, 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 this network of, of resources that promote uh, the, 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 the advancement of, of, of the, the space economy and ultimately of the new space economy, in space economy. So, uh, well, I think uh, I have, uh, I couldn't conclude uh, better than uh, the panel members just did. And I would like uh, to take just the opportunity to thank them for uh, taking the time to come to this panel and have this uh, very enlightening discussions uh, with us uh, together today. And I would like to thank also the audience for their patience and, and uh, their interest they showed in this uh, topic and the UIA uh, for uh, selecting the topic uh, we had the chance now to discuss with you. Many thanks and uh, a nice uh, 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 congress for the time remaining. Thank you.